I'm proud to admit on camera and on the internet that I will never talk to any police officer under any circumstances. I believe that in these new articulations of anarchy, queerness isn't something that is held apart. The politics of gender and sexuality are not held apart from the politics of class and race or the economy. They're absolutely embedded in it. Trans people, queer people, and they were doing something different. This is a bigger moment, a moment that is about solidarity across identities rather than just making the claim for your group. Okay, I guess I'll do a little intro. I probably should have written like a little intro down, but um, I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, hey, I am uh, Ace from the channel Econ Envy. I go by she, they pronouns, and I have a very special guest today. Um, so this is That Dane Dad, AKA Phil. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Phil. I go by That Dang Dad or That Dang Phil online. Um, 39, I live in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I have a three-year-old daughter and I currently work in um, software development and user experience design. It's kind of my day job, but uh, by night, I enjoy uh, putting together YouTube videos about pop culture and philosophy and I don't know, general general society, I don't know what you would call it, but uh, kind of from a kind of a left wing, uh, left wing perspective. And uh, but try to keep it pretty gentle and pretty easy and pretty, uh, pretty breezy for people that might not have had exposure to these ideas before. I like to be pretty chill. And um, that's kind of what my it's what people like about my channels. It's very gentle introductions to certain things and, and the gentle discussions of things. So um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's my deal. Yeah. Um, yeah, you kind of have that sort of ASMR vibe almost. Um, I'm sure you've gotten that like 10,000 times, but oh, for sure. yeah, but no, yeah. it's fun. Um, so yeah, um, could you, well, I guess you kind of already did, but, <laughs> um, could you tell us about a bit about yourself and what you do both on YouTube, but also with, um, I believe you work with queer youth, like as a volunteer thing. Yeah. So, um, Professionally, uh, when I moved to Louisville, I took a digital marketing job and um, specifically geared towards e-commerce. Uh, I worked for a company that was uh, uh, it's called B2B. I'm trying to think of how much lingo to put in this. It's a B2B company, which means a business that sells to business. So we didn't really sell to consumers. We sold safety equipment to companies that needed to buy hard hats, vests, glasses, things like that. And uh, I was in charge of the kind of web zone that these companies would use to buy from us. And through working with that, I got into producing safety content that would, uh, you know, uh, we want you to buy the right product for the right application and not hurt yourself. So here's how to use a hard hat. Here's how to use a harness. And so from there, I got into learning about how, to, how do you produce good content? How do you produce things that people want to read? How do you um, how do you design web experiences that are easy for people to use? From there, I got into um, what we call UX, uh, user experience design. And as I was studying that, I got into um, accessibility design and how to make sure that your websites are accessible for people with various disabilities. And so that was kind of this long path that led me to where I am now, which is why I'm developing apps for a different company. Um, applying these types of things, also being kind of an accessibility advocate at the company and uh, just generally using my knowledge of how, how uh, using my knowledge of where people get stuck on things, my knowledge of how people's brains sometimes get stuck on different experiences, using my knowledge of how people get frustrated, how people get excluded uh, kind of using that knowledge to make sure that the things that we build are not excluding people, not frustrating mm -hmm. people, not causing them pain points and things like that. And so um, that's where I developed a passion for um, accessibility, a passion for disabled activism. Um, you know, and, and as I mentioned, I have a YouTube channel uh, where I produce, you know, content that's more geared towards like, you know, philosophical types of things. But uh, I apply the same kinds of lessons that I've been learning. You know, how do you build 
a YouTube channel that is as inclusive as possible? How do you make a YouTube video that the most, you know, the most number of people can get something out of? Mm -hmm. What are the kinds of things that would make somebody feel excluded if you were trying to explain some kind of topic to them related to your activism types of things like that? And so that's something where as, as somebody kind of on the, um, you know, Z list left to celebrity type, um, I'm really passionate about helping this community of activists and organizers and content creators. I'm really passionate about using what I know to help them present their message in a way that mm -hmm. is inviting, that is inclusive, that doesn't have lots of pain points for people. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think sometimes you know, the, you know, the joke of the old, you know, the old communist is the old guy with the long beard and he's got the big stack of books, mm -hmm. you know, and your, your Slavoj Zizek types that are speaking in, you know, and this I claim, you know, this, the, 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 the hyper masculinity, <laughs> you know, all that stuff, like using the lingo that people don't understand, mm -hmm. you know, can be very alienating for yeah. some people. And so I'm really passionate about reducing that alienation, mm -hmm. you know, theory is great i love theory read more theory but you know let's distill it let's mm -hmm. let's make it something that people can understand let's make it something that people can get excited about and get um you know emotional about and things like that and, and i think that's something that i really learned as i was studying marketing is um you got to give people like you know and it's cliche at this point but you got to give people a story to get them to emotionally invest in something you know mm -hmm. people don't invest in uh, people don't invest it's funny to say people don't invest in logic you know mm -hmm. facts and logic and reason they don't they invest in stories they mm -hmm. invest in a narrative that makes sense to them and mm -hmm. so you're really the um, jordan peterson of the left one you know <laughs> I'm, I'm always saying that <laughs> always saying that it's, but mm -hmm. but I have a plant-based diet, not a meat diet. So. Okay, yeah. That's our, nice. that's our one difference. <laughs> um, uh, oh, but yeah, and then so, um, and then in my, uh, my, my offline life, my AFK life, um, yeah, I do mentor with a local uh, queer teen outreach in Louisville, Kentucky called uh, Louisville Youth Group. Um, it is a... Uh, started out as, as a, you know, 13 to 20, uh, anybody that's LGBT or even ally, um, 13 to 20, but we're expanding it to include younger and younger people because there's just, we're learning that there's, especially nowadays that people are more comfortable talking about and exploring these issues. I mean, we're, we're meeting kids that are seven, six and five that are, you know, gender non-conforming or just, curious about their gender in ways that um you know is pretty new to talk about in 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 mainstream society so to right. speak and so we're we're trying to expand this mentor kind of program to include basically as young as young as makes sense but mm -hmm. um the main group is, is 13 to 20 year olds and it's all kids from the local area uh, although some of them you know we're in kentucky louisville kentucky is a major metro area mm -hmm. but you know um right outside of louisville there's rural indiana and rural kentucky they ain't that far away and so we right. get we got kids that coming from three hours away sometimes to just hang out with other queer kids because you know they go to school and they're the only queer kid in their entire high school mm -hmm. out in you know out, out in the sticks in kentucky yeah. you know which is can be very lonely and so yeah um even even just our small group services a huge radius square mileage wise just because of you know how communities kind of evolve out here and stuff like that so mm -hmm. basically i'm a mentor with them so we we do programming every it used to be weekly and then COVID hit and kind of wrecked everything now we're, we're doing every other week and we just do um we do everything from um arts and crafts and you know movie nights just kind of goofing off nights to playing board games to um bringing in uh, people from the community bringing in um, doctors to talk about, uh, you know, healthcare issues and, and mm -hmm. sexual health and bringing in psychologists to talk about consent and mm -hmm. emotional communication, stuff like that. And 
everything up to and including, you know, I've done a self-defense seminar with them. We've had other people do job training, you know, and mm -hmm. so it's just kind of whatever, you know, it's, it's kind of whatever um, people from the community can bring, but also it's just a space for the kids to hang out. And lately, I think the world has been so grim. The kids really don't even want any particular programming. They're not asking us, hey, come educate me. They're just like, can I just fucking chill for mm -hmm. three hours? Can I just go somewhere where I'm not going to get made fun of, where I'm not going to yeah. get hit, and where I'm not going to have to hear about everybody in Florida legislator trying to kill me? Oh yeah. You know, can I just come here and just be goofy and talk about anime with a bunch of other kids? And it's like, hell yeah, man. Like, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. So we sometimes we just provide a room mm -hmm. for the kids to hang out in and just goof off, and it seems to do good for them. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, like... Uh, by the way, I have ADHD, so if I if I do, like, a long pause or whatever, just, <laughs> like, that's that's on me. Um, I guess, like... All good? Yeah, yeah like, it, it's really fascinating, especially... Like, providing the resources and also, like, a space to just exist is definitely really important i know um in my area i am very lucky in a lot of regards um my particular area um and i'm i don't really want to like dox myself online but like um my particular area is not like a super um i mean i live in the suburbs but um it's not like a super um like what would be the term like queer friendly is not the right word but like it's you know, it's a lot of old people, um, and there's a lot of great old yeah. people, don't get me wrong, but, like, it's very much, like, um, kind of, like, very traditional sort of areas, and I'm in, like, the one section of that area that, like, there's just, like, a ton of queer kids for some reason. No idea why. Um, but, like, and, you know, there's not, like, I mean, and yeah, maybe it's just that um, they feel more, like, comfortable being out in this, like, very particular area because there's, like, a bunch of others, but, um, and, you know, that, of course, there are queer kids everywhere, including in very repressive areas, but, like, um, it's, it's definitely a big, like, really important thing to have those people to kind of just, like, oh, my internet connection? Hello? I lost you for, like, oh, oh my god, um, 15 seconds. Okay, sorry, where was I? Uh, you were talking about the area and you were just saying it was important to create a... Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, just because with my personal experience, um, like, not not having those, like, not having to explain every single stepping stone of, like, basic knowledge regarding, like, trans issues, for instance, right? Yeah. Like, it's very nice to have someone who can just, like, you can just talk to and not feel like you are an educator, right? So I think, yeah, that's very important to have those kind of spaces. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we get, we get kids that come in and it'll be like their first time, you know, and it, you know, I remember being a teen showing up to places the first time and just like, I don't want to look like an idiot. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want to make fun of me. You know, and these kids will come in, it'll be their first time and they'll be like, hi, my name is such and such. Um, I'm trying out these pronouns tonight and I'm not sure if they fit. So you can just call me these pronouns and I'm just seeing if I like them or not. Mm -hmm. And all the other kids are like, Oh yeah, yeah, totally. And I'm just like, wow. Like th that is unthinkable from mm -hmm. when I was a teen that, that a, a group of teens would be that cool with that kind of ambiguity and B that any teen would feel that comfortable walking into a bunch of strangers and saying, Hey, here's something really ambiguous about my own personal identity. Right. Um, do you all want to explore that with me? And everybody's just like, oh yeah. And I'm like, mm -hmm. wow. Like uh, that's, it's just so impressive. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we, I talk about us, us mentors creating a space, but it's really the kids that are creating the space and they, they advocate for each other and mm -hmm. they, they advocate for each other's uh, like sensory needs. We used to do this thing where we would clap for people when it was their first time coming, you know, first time coming. And then some of the kids came up and said, "Hey, some of us, some of the kids have mm -hmm. sensory issues, and the clapping is really, uh, yeah, it's like triggering for them. Can we do something else?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, totally." And so mm -hmm. we, uh, we just we kind of do jazz hands now, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, they'll advocate for each other's like disabilities, and they mm -hmm. stand up for each other and create space for each other to just try on personalities. And I mean, it's just it's yeah. really, really cool. Like I'm just I'm so impressed. Yeah, and. 
I mean, it, it's so amazing because, like, I find when I'm reading, like, whether, like, theory or just, like, even, like, an academic paper or whatever, and they talk about, like, these queer spaces, um, it can oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes can feel like um, there, there's this distance of, like, you know, well... I'm not sure if, like, you know, this is the most, like, theoretically correct way to do things and whatnot, right? Um, and, and it's, like, but you actually, like, go to the, a lot of these spaces. Um, and don't get me wrong. It's not like there are never problems. But yeah. the you see these people, like, actually in real time, like, negotiating and creating these spaces and, like, finding ways to, like, support each other and build each other up. And, yeah, like, dealing with conflict and whatnot. Um and like learning how to do that in safer and better ways. Um, it's just it. It's really incredible, and it's like great that there are spaces where like they're allowed to not be like underestimated in that regard. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so to go to a topic, of course, that um, I'm sure most people have asked you about um, in these kinds of things. Um, so you you were a former police officer. Um, mm -hmm. So. Um, could I ask, like, how um, did you start working as a police officer, and what was kind of the reason? Yeah, I uh, I was <clears throat> when I graduated, I got a um, I got a scholarship to um, a university in California, mm -hmm. kind of by where I lived, for their school of business. And my dad had always been a um, He'd always worked in kind of office settings and so on. anytime that i would hang out with my dad at work or you know do something go visit him at work or something like that you know i was just i was used to thinking of like being a grown-up as like working in a cubicle wearing mm -hmm. a tie and all that stuff and so um i just kind of assumed like oh i'll get a i didn't even really have any idea about what i wanted to do i was like oh, i'll just get a business degree and go you know do business or right. whatever whatever that means <laughs> and so um i got a scholarship to school business Start a college, just kind of, you know, being a weird college kid and making, making a fool out of myself. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, um, but I wasn't really like hooked by anything in college at the time. I, there wasn't anything that really like, I wasn't really motivated by anything. I was just kind of going through the motions. And then my dad, uh, had, had quit his job to become a consultant for a while. Mm -hmm. And then, through a friend of a friend got hooked up with this local police officer who would take him on ride alongs. Mm. Cause my dad, uh, when he was a teen, always wanted to be a cop mm -hmm. and just never did it when, you know, was, we took a different route. So he starts doing ride alongs with this friend of his and he's just like loving it, but he's in his forties at the time. And he's just like, man, I wish I would have done this instead of my, you know, instead of what I did do. And the guy was like, well, just do it anyway. Become a become a reserve police officer. You know, reserve officers are basically, you go through all the same training, but you're, uh, you only work like a couple times a week. You know, it's kind of like yeah. army reserve or whatever. So he ends up going into the police academy at 44, he completes the police academy. Um, and he lost all his weight. He got all buff, <laughs> you know, and... Uh, <laughs> He started swearing you know my dad's a well preacher's kid and used to be a preacher and so mm -hmm. like i'd never heard my dad swear before he's like bringing home guns and knives and you know pepper spray and tasers and mm -hmm. he's out having all this fun like adventure fun like that's what it seemed like yeah. and i was like wow like man i don't want to i don't want to regret having a boring life like, right you know i'm i'm young now why don't i go have an adventure so Two years after he graduated the police academy, I went into the police academy and um, got hired at a city right next door to his. So mm -hmm. we were we were both technically we were both like rookie cops right next door <laughs> to each other. But um, yeah, it was it was kind of just through watching him have fun and kind of open up his uh, you know just it kind of changed his personality, you know, in, in a way that we thought was cool. Um, mm -hmm. And it just looked like he was having fun, and I was like, well, "I want to have fun too." And so that's how I that's how I got into it. Yeah. And um, I was definitely not very good at it at first because mm -hmm. I came from a very come from a very sheltered um, just a just a life of unimaginable privilege. <laughs> and uh, I was I lived in you know very white, very upscale neighborhoods my entire life. And the the first job I was able to get as a cop, or the, well, the only job I got as a cop 
was in a predominantly Hispanic first and second generation immigrant mm. community that was extremely poor, mm. extremely poor. Yeah. And it was extremely poor and extremely Hispanic. And I was neither of those things. And it was just a hot mess <laughs> coming into that community and just having no idea sort of how to treat people and stuff like that. Right. But, um, but yeah, I, um, yeah, that, that's to answer your question. That's that's how I got started in that. Yeah, um, yeah, it's definitely like I don't know. There, I guess there's a lot of reasons why people join the police, you know. Um, but yeah, there definitely is this sort of I don't know. Like, would you say like mythology surrounding um, kind of police? And like, you know, of course, you see all the TV shows, you see all the movies yeah. and whatnot. Um, it's like oh, yeah. Anytime, anytime mm-hmm. CBS has an hour to fill, mm-hmm. quick, throw in a new cop show. You right. Know? And it's like, yeah. And, and the the kind of communities that I grew up in, we revered the military, we revered mm-hmm. cops and firefighters. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was this. It was very prestigious. It had a lot of prestige. It had a lot of like cultural. Like you would tell people, like, wow, thanks mm-hmm. for your service. Right. Like, wow. You know what I mean? Like just people would they want to listen to your story. I love. It, it's probably not evident in my, either my online life or in this interview, but I love to talk. I love to tell stories mm-hmm. and um, everybody wants to hear a cop story. Right. right. Like, and so, yeah, you it's know, just, what was like, I never the most knew anybody dangerous that was, thing you've done. Yeah. <laughs> you ever killed anybody? <laughs> you know, I always ask that. What a and, thing um, to ask someone. No. Oh yeah. my God. That's like, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what other people's comforts are. For me personally, that seems like very invasive to ask of someone, but. Well, and it, I mean, it just speaks to the kinds of circles that I grew up mm. in that it's law enforcement is very, an abstract idea. Right. It was, it was a dangerous job where you work with bad guy, you know what I mean? Mm. But it's the kind of communities that I lived in, we didn't, we're not abused by cops, you right. know, we're not hassled and tortured by cops mm-hmm. and called the cops to hassle other people and so right. for them it was very like oh you ever killed anybody it's like they're not thinking of a real human they're not thinking of their neighbor right which is who i would have killed right like they're not think they're not picturing joe next door or yeah. like oh you ever killed anybody they're picturing the nebulous other right the shadowy other guy that mm-hmm. isn't human to them so you know yeah um the, you know the kind of criminal that you can write off because like they're comically evil and yeah you know all they want is to steal candy from babies and you know mm-hmm. yeah no yeah. i get it um so i i guess um kind of relating to um the kind of going back to like with the queer stuff so i guess like growing up not necessarily childhood but just kind of like you know you talk a bit like about you know you were in that community that very much revered the police and whatnot um, like how were queer issues discussed and um, how did that like, kind of change as you encountered queer people as a police officer? So I grew up, um, I grew up in, I was born in California, but I lived in uh, Texas for a long time and then moved mm-hmm. back to California. And basically until I was in my teens, I grew up in very, very fundamentalist Christian mm. communities um we we were old school church of christ the old time religion like we thought uh instrumental music was sinful that's how oh kind of old i think we i were. think i've heard about that yeah yeah so uh so how are queer issues discussed they were not <laughs> they they were not um mm-hmm. nobody talked about it mm-hmm. um queer people didn't exist in the church <clears throat> sorry <laughs> you're fine coffee grounds coffee grounds um queer people you know there were no queer people in the church for one they mm-hmm. were they were out there mm-hmm. and to the extent that they were ever like um i'll probably say this a million times this was before your time but right. um uh and, and you'll laugh now you'll laugh to hear this but there was i, I specifically remember one year when ellen degeneres on her TV show mm. that was on primetime, Ellen DeGeneres came out as gay yeah. on the show. Mm-hmm. Woo, baby, did that just what a what a just what a what a nightmare for yeah. the for the 
<laughs> for the Christian community. I mean, this was just beyond the pale. They're mm -hmm. they're shoving gay people into our homes now. And mm -hmm. Can you believe it? And they're trying to recruit. And mm -hmm. I mean, that was even the the episode. I mean, we watched the episode, and it was that was even the joke was that there was a running joke that um, Laura Dern was trying to recruit new gay people to be gay. Mm -hmm. You know, it was kind of played for laughs. But like that was a legitimate fear in the community that I grew up in. It was mm -hmm. like they're out there they're trying to seduce you they're trying to yeah. lure you in you know and so you know nobody nobody talked about it. didn't i did not have the lexicon mm -hmm. to think about these things and like i looking back like i know i was bisexual basically from the minute i was you know having my you know your teenage sexual awakenings right. or whatever when, when you start to develop your sexuality like i knew i was bisexual from then but like i didn't have the words for it the only words I knew was like sinful and temptation and you know and so I just I assumed that uh, the devil put these ideas in everybody's head and that was just what that was just that was the struggle you know you you go to church and the devil puts bad ideas in your head and you just shove them laid down and pray real hard and they'll go away and you know and um yeah, actually, when I got involved in law enforcement, it was the first time that I stopped going to church every Sunday because I was working weekends. So I was working weekend graveyards for most of my career. And so I just stopped, you know, I wasn't going to, I got off work at 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to go to church at 8. <laughs> I didn't sleep. So I just stopped going. And so, um, yeah. And then the community that I, that I worked with was, um, like I said, predominantly Hispanic. So, mm -hmm. um, I don't want to get too outside my lane here, but right. there's definitely a machismo culture in the city that I worked in. There was a big cultural concern with masculinity and being mm -hmm. a real man and that kind of thing. And there's a big Catholic, um, mm -hmm. Catholic presence in the community. And so um, there were definitely a lot of queer people in that community, but they were um, not thriving, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, not, there was not, a, it was not a progressive paradise or anything right. like that. But um, yeah, I think in terms of sort of what changed, you mm -hmm. know, I got to, and it's something too that, that even beyond the kind of the, the queer community in terms of what I experienced when I was in law enforcement was, you know, so I grew up conservative, Republican, you mm -hmm. know, very right wing and right. so you have all these ideas about you know the people on welfare they're lazy they just want the handouts they don't want to work mm -hmm. you know and so you have this idea about like oh this other over here yeah that you're trying to undermine our american values you know right. the founders you know you get out there and i'll, I'll never forget and i'll tie this back to queer, queer stuff in a minute but like i'll never forget this one time we arrested this guy on a warrant he he had a warrant for traffic ticket or whatever that he wasn't able to pay so he didn't yeah. show up to court so it turns into a warrant we're driving around we stop a guy he's got this warrant so we mm. arrest him and i'm going to fingerprint him and we we had this kind of computer that fingerprinted people and it couldn't get his fingerprints because his mm. hands were so rough mm -hmm. and i was like and so i was just making small talk with him and i was like damn man your, this computer cannot pick up your fingerprints your hands are yeah your hands are all fucked up mm. and he said yeah i've been roofing since i was 14 and roofing is a hard job. I don't know. I don't even know anything about roofing. That is hard work. Mm -hmm. Hot. You're working with hot tar. Yeah. I mean, it's dangerous. I mean, it's just dangerous, backbreaking work. This kid's, yeah. this guy's been roofing. He was in his fifties or something. And I said, "Oh wow!" I said, it "Really took a toll on your body." And he's like, "Yeah." And yeah. he's like, "I'll tell you. Since I was a kid, I knew I'd be working every day of my life until I died." And he just said that kind of offhandedly and. But that really stuck out to me that this guy that I was arresting, this guy that I'd been told was one of these leeches undermining American values. I'm like, that guy has worked five times harder than I've ever worked in my entire life. Yeah. And and he's just resigned to the fact that he's got no, they ain't no 401k mm -hmm. for the first generation immigrant roofer, right? Like right. he's going to have to work until his body gives up on him and he dies. And I just, I had never thought of that before. I never... Mm -hmm encountered that before and it was really it really stuck with me and so in the same way you know i would run into these um queer people in the city and some of them were sex workers right. um you know just to get by just kind of survival sex workers 
um, there were lots of people in the closet that were uh, mm -hmm. struggling with um, just struggling with all that, struggling with getting outed. And it was just, I kept writing into people whose personal lived experience was messy and it mm -hmm. didn't fit into, you know, it didn't fit in, you know, there's three kinds of people in the mm -hmm. world. Like that's, <laughs> they didn't fit in any kind of specific archetype right? right like they didn't they weren't just a stock character mm -hmm. you know they were a real human being that was messy and they they had trauma that they were working through and they had and they were traumatizing others because mm -hmm. of you know and, and they were they were victims and they were perpetrators and right. they were they needed help and they you know it's like it was just that was one of the hugest positive things i guess i can say about my time in law enforcement is that it really shook me out of a black and white uh you know there's there's only this and there's only that kind right. of worldview it really opened me up to being uh or really helped me open my mind up to shades of gray and um a world that is much, much, much more complicated than the yeah. media and talk radio mm -hmm. and pundits would have you believe. Like the world is very, very, very messy. Mm -hmm. There's no perfect victims, right? right. Like, oh yeah, no, absolutely. And, and there's almost never any unredeemable bad guys. I mean, I met, I met some pretty bad dudes, but you know, there were people that, you know, there are these, these gangsters that would, you know, murder people, but then you get their life story and they grew up, neglected they grew up abused they grew up with no help from society yeah. nobody cares about these people so of course they have antisocial tendencies because mm. the social failed them yeah right <laughs> like what did we ever what did we ever do for these people why mm. would they care about our uh, you know right. our comfort and well-being so yeah it just it really opened me up to to accepting the messiness of life which i think my time particularly working with queer kids, it's been a real benefit because mm -hmm. particularly nowadays, particularly in 2022, I think the queer community is so diverse. And mm -hmm. so, you know, playing with concepts that even I don't really understand, like neo pronouns, I don't, I don't understand, like even doing the work that I do with queer teens, I don't understand why somebody wants to be called a neo pronoun personally, or mm -hmm. Um, I've met kids that they're they're starting to use it it it's as their pronouns. Yeah, I don't understand that because just five or ten years ago, that was a huge dehumanizing thing that right. people foisted onto the mm -hmm. to the queer community. And so I knew I knew queer people five and ten years ago for whom that was a huge huge trigger to be called an it. Mm -hmm. But I, I know kids now that are reclaiming it. Mm -hmm. Like so, I don't personally understand it but I don't have to. Like, yeah, no. It's not my, it's not my job to mm. understand what something does for somebody. I yeah. only know that for some reason being called it does something good for this person. So mm. I'm going to do that for them because I want good things for this person. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I definitely think like with a lot of those things, um, there is, like it's it's really nice to be able to kind of have that articulated or be able to articulate you know when you personally go through it um like in a way that other people can understand but like also at the same time yeah like at the, the end of the day um i mean for me like it's very difficult for me to um i mean even like relate to um like i don't know like i mean, to an extent like even being cis and whatnot or um you know or, um, like, what is super appealing about being, like, a binary trans person, right? Um, and, like, there, mm -hmm. there's an extent that I have that, like, a little bit of experience, because I knew, like, because, you know, I grew up cis, of course, and um, for a period of time, I thought I was a binary trans girl. Um, and, you know, I say that, and, like, of course, I want to be very clear that, like, um, there's nothing wrong with those things, <laughs> you know? They're, um, they're like, people there's sort of a point where it's like you know you kind of have to realize that like no one's going to perfectly understand anyone else's experience um but there's like 
there's so much we can do to help support them right um and like not just like in a um oh you know it'll make you happy so i guess i do it but like fully you know embrace and accept it um yeah and so i guess i'm sorry i think coming from a kind of super conservative republican background there's Mm -hmm. it's a really um there's this idea in those kinds of communities where everything that ma- everything that matters should be explainable mm-hmm. and you should be able to logic yourself into it. And so in those kinds of communities, if, if somebody has a weird idea, it's on them to sit you down and put their little PowerPoint presentation right. up and go, let me logic you. Uh, 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 premise one and premise two and ergo therefore qed mm-hmm. and then you know it, you you re- you reason together mm-hmm. and you you come to this perfect scientific conclusion that we can all agree on mm-hmm. and I, I think that's a real source of comfort for the conservative mind is mm-hmm. that like no the, the facts that matter in the world we can all agree on them because we yeah. can all understand them and boy is that just not true like mm-hmm. it just isn't true like we all we are all our own people and mm-hmm. we have our own you know we have our own experiences and i don't i don't need to, <laughs> it is not your job mm-hmm. to argue for your own dignity right, right. like it's not your job to to convince me to persuade me that you deserve mm-hmm. dignity and respect and regard like that should just be a given yeah and, um know, you're one of those postmodernists, aren't you? You know, <laughs> but no, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely agree. And kind of parroting back to that sort of um, life is messy kind of thing. Um, yeah, I, I think a big part of um, a lot of the research I've been doing recently, um, not like on the ground research, but as in reading other people's stuff, um, is that. Um, big big thing like over and over and over again to the point of almost like you know just repetition to a um, monotony is that um people are complicated and that um we really really like to fit people into these boxes right we really like to fit people into these it it can feel almost like they're our own like mini nations to an extent of um like even like to the extent of like of course you know we think like oh um like you know conservative types um want to like put people into the easy other but um to a certain extent even like within um at least i've noticed like in some queer communities and certainly not all but um like there is the gay community and there is the lesbian community and like there is a model way to be that and to perform that and to like there's an essence there that like can you know if you don't meet this like very specific um very exclusionary criteria you know like you're not really um in you know like bisexual people of course they're um you know they're just very confused and really they're actually gay but you know like they want to hold on to that privilege you know like it, it's very much that um like it plays back into that sort of like gay straight dichotomy but like almost i guess on the side of like the gay but like um uh, the gay but <laughs> um but yeah i i just think it's it's very important to realize that like um there i don't don't know like what would be a good analogy you know but they're almost like this is okay this is gonna be a weird very weird comparison so have you seen um the phantom menace yes so you know how they go into the underwater area and there's like the bubble there kind of it's almost i feel like the communities are more like that where it's kind of just fluid and you kind of just like flow in and out of it um instead of like rather than these rigid walls you know very weird comparison but i don't know that that makes sense yeah Yeah. it's i think um mm -hmm. i think that's something that i particularly uh you know having grown up in the 80s and, Mm -hmm. and sort of you know i i've come out fairly recently Mm -hmm. you know i've I've known i've known i was queer for a long time and couldn't admit it for a long time didn't have the words for it for a long time but like it's something that i've definitely worked on a lot is just being Mm -hmm. like like yeah maybe it's not um 
you know, it doesn't all need to be boundaries and that not, not everything needs to be per perfectly, uh, you know, cat categorizable, like a mm -hmm. Pokedex or something. You know what I mean? Like not everything just needs to be, mm -hmm. uh, you know, stats and this and that. And yeah. I mean, it's just porous. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's ambiguous and gray and, you know, are you, you know, even like, you know, am I bi or am I pan or am mm -hmm. I omni? I don't even know what the, like, well, you know what the difference is. Like, right, right. Who cares? Like, hey, who, whatever. Like, you know, I don't, it, it, is it that important? Like, mm -hmm. I guess labeling has gotten very of lower importance every year for me because mm -hmm. it's like, I, I don't know, call me, call me whatever. Like, I just, yeah. just let me do my thing, right? Like, right, right. I'm just, I'm just going to chase bliss and, you know, treat people right and, and, yeah. You know, whatever that label ends up being, I'll let that, I'll let that be a, you know. Yeah, and I think I'll like, let that be descriptive at the end of the day, not prescriptive. Right. You know. And I think like a lot of um. Yeah, actually, like one of my later questions was about labels, um, because like, I feel like with a lot of these sort of labels and the, the pseudo communities that build around it, again, like you know, it, it's very porous, but like um how um it's like there's enough people like in these groups that are like have some distinct factors that like you don't want to just like merge them completely together and say oh they're all the same because of course like you know there are some like reasonable differences right but at the same time there's enough people that are very similar to each other but you also don't want to be like these are very distinct separate like you know cut a fine line between them and you're either this or that um so it, it yeah like navigating that is difficult and i can understand why it would be frustrating to some people at the same time it's like very liberating in a lot of ways yeah 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 it's and it's like i uh <laughs> sometimes i uh there's a i don't know if it's a catchphrase or whatever mm -hmm. i would call it but like there's a thing that i say to people sometimes when they're being gatekeepy mm -hmm. or uh you know needlessly trying to slot people into boxes and things is i always say hey I release you from the burden of having to care about that. Mm -hmm. Like, let let me take that burden from you. Mm -hmm. You don't have to. You don't have to do this. You don't have to live this way. Like, free yourself <laughs> and enjoy the freedom that comes mm -hmm. from not having to go. You're this and not that. Like, mm -hmm. you don't have to do that. You don't have mm -hmm. to be the gender cop. You don't have right. to be the sex cop. Like, just mm -hmm. I retire. Enjoy mm -hmm. retirement. Like, it's, yeah. it is. It's nice. It's nice to not have to. Yeah. You know, not have to worry. Oh, is he trying to get one over on me? Like that's the, that's a huge issue in American culture. Mm -hmm. Is that Americans are terrified that someone's trying to get one over on them. Yeah, someone's trying to trick me, because mm -hmm. in America, someone is always trying to trick you, right? Like yeah. <laughs> you're always being tricked. You're always being suckered into things. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah. So unfortunately, we extend that to people. Like, I think he's not this. He's that. Like. Mm -hmm. You don't have to care about that. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, like, the sort of, because to an extent, there's always going to be a level of, like, abstraction or generalization, right? Like, it's, whenever you're going to be, like, advocating for a certain group of people's, like, yeah. whether rights or even just, like, freedoms or whatever, right? Um, there's a certain level of, like, you know, like with any model, there's going to be like kind of a, yeah, again, generalization, abstraction. Um, and so trying to like toe that line between like recognizing that, but also not ending up falling into that trap of being very gatekeepy or being very like, it's this and that. Um, it can be very difficult, of course. Um, and I don't know if I have a perfect answer to it. Um, you know, like I think it's sort of something we have to continually negotiate and figure out yeah yeah um yeah and like going back to a little bit to what you said about um how this was a little bit back but how you were talking about when you saw the ellen um, you saw ellen degeneres come out as gay um and how that was like a big um like panic like oh my god you know there's who's next right um it, you know it, you said i would laugh but like um, and I think I chuckled a little bit at um, one of the voices you did, but like, um, I see a lot of that even today, you know, and not to the same extent, especially with gay people, like that in certain communities for sure, but like at least more, 
I don't know, mainstream, I guess. Um, you know, that's much less. But you see that a lot with, like, I mean, trans people, for instance. The whole thing about um, how, you know, all of the... What's the, like, the term, the pseudo-scientific term of, like, basically your friends are peer pressuring you into being trans um R rapid onset yeah gender dysphoria. yeah um like that whole thing is very reminiscent of like the gay panic that um oh, yeah and a lot of people of course called them out for like this is literally just like homophobia from like a few decades ago right but uh, yeah, it's repackaged. Just repackaged yeah. yeah um yeah. yeah it's all the same that's that is one of the benefits to being a little bit older mm. uh, it would be more fun to be younger right now but <laughs> I well, actually probably wouldn't. I don't know, but hmm. um, but yeah, one of the benefits to being you know my age and older is um, we've seen it before. I've yeah. seen the exact same thing, the same panic, the same freakouts, the mm. same like you know it's gonna under. They swore to me, Christians swore to me that if we let the gays marry, mm. I mean that society was over. I mm. mean that's just if you can't even agree on one man, how are we even gonna? And nothing happened mm. like right like nothing happened when mm. we let when we let gay people get married mm. it didn't undermine society it no, didn't we're not destroy. marrying we're not marrying animals now we're not like you know. marry their cow <laughs> it's just like yeah, we've seen mm. the exact same panic before and, and it's from the same people mm -hmm. the same people that got made a fool of 20 years ago right, right back at it yeah just, you know. yeah it can it's frustrating, but at least it's like you kind of get to see it, you know, and you get you, you kind of like, you know, you, you can like point it out at least now. And yeah. I guess with like, I mean, I guess with the Internet and whatnot, there is more of an opportunity to go like to educate people and go like, hey, this is the exact same stuff as opposed to earlier. It's like if you didn't have like that very mainstream access, like television, I guess would be a big one. Um, you really couldn't get that out there, could you? Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. And it's just this wasn't. It wasn't um, polite is the right word, but just, you know, it, it wasn't something that people really was a mainstream discussion, you know, mm -hmm. like, and the, and the, the gay, the gay marriage panic is just a, you know, a reheated rehash of the, uh, you know, um, interracial marriage panic yep. of, you know, whatever the, the, the 30s, 40s, 50s, mm -hmm. same stuff over mm -hmm. and over and over again. But like, yeah, to your point, at least on the internet, this is all documented, and mm -hmm. you know, you could throw you could throw together a five minute YouTube video, right. basically just like, hey, remember this, and then mm -hmm. remember this, remember this. Now this guy's saying this, mm -hmm. same stuff, you know. But yeah, back in the old days, it was like you know, the all the media was very gate kept. Yeah, uh, unless you knew somebody that was producing their own underground zine or something, like, right you know who was talking you had to be like adjacent to the community to even right. hear that yeah i was i was talking earlier with um a friend of mine who's very much into like disa uh, disability activism right um and they were talking about like all of these different like uh sort of like government programs and like um resources and like communities and like all of these different stuff right um and i i would just like remark to them like this feels like an entire like underworld you know like this feels like and it's not because it's like never it's not there or that even like it's particularly shady or anything because it's not um it's just that like it's not talked about anywhere right um and so yeah i mean it's like again like going back to i mean you know when you were growing up like with um all of the stuff about like gay people and of course trans people too because i mean god knows like that was a whole thing um but like there was like all of those things and those communities and whatnot still existed not in the same way of course but um but it was like so much underground and so much like yeah. you know just not talked about um you know publicly um, unless you knew a person who knew a person so yeah and for and for safety reasons too i mean it was mm -hmm. You know, oh yeah for sure just uh mm -hmm. yeah you, you swore you were not allowed to deviate from the norm in that way <laughs> right um so um i you know eventually you know you weren't a part of the police force anymore and i think if i recall correctly that you kind of it, you stopped because like you moved or something like that um like it was sort of a um like it, like, it was a circumstantial thing um but like could you talk about sort of 
what it was like sort of to as you got out of that and then as you started your views started to change over time um but yes towards the so when i first started mm -hmm. in law enforcement like I, like I mentioned i was very sheltered very um unprepared to to do right. that kind of job in that kind of community and so the trainers that were coaching me their big problem with me was that i wasn't violent enough i wasn't mm. aggressive enough and so they um they hazed me quite a bit for mm -hmm. one <laughs> quite a bit of hazing um i got put on essentially double probation which basically they were saying like hey we're gonna fire you if you don't get better yeah and the big issue was with what they would they call officer safety but that was my aggression and so i almost lost my job for not being a huge enough dick to people mm -hmm. so i had to learn how to be an asshole cop you yeah. know and so for the first half of my career like mean, that's what i did was i learned how to have a heavy hand i got into all kinds of fights um escalated a lot of things that didn't need to get escalated just to prove that i was tough just to prove mm -hmm. to the other officers that i could handle it i would escalate fights mm -hmm. and just you know and towards the back half of my career i was just i was like man this sucks <laughs> this sucks this is not my person that's just not my personality i mm -hmm. don't enjoy hurting people yeah and uh but it sounds funny to say but it's just like it's not that's not the kind of career i wanted to have and that's mm -hmm. not what i you know, even then, um, I thought of law enforcement as like naively or whatever, but like I still thought of law enforcement as like, hey, we're here to help. Ultimately, we're here to help people. Right. I'm not here to go out on a Saturday night and beat up drunks for 12 hours. Like, that's mm -hmm. not my calling. Yeah. My job is to help people. I ideally, if I'm doing my job well, this community will be safer. People will be happier. They will thrive. They mm -hmm. will keep their possessions safe, that kind of thing. And so I gradually got into de-escalation de-escalation tactics um i was studying interview and interrogation at the time and i was really enjoying talking to people and de-escalating things and so mm -hmm. um uh so when as i was kind of exiting my career i was already starting to get tired of the law enforcement culture right um, but it wasn't until I really got out of it for a couple of years and I'd, I had moved from California to Minnesota and I didn't have a college degree cause mm -hmm. I dropped out of college to go to the police academy. I could not get a cop job in Minnesota hmm. because they said I have enough, uh, you know, enough schooling. And I was like, okay. I just been a cop for almost a decade in a pretty, you know, pretty tough area. Does that count in like a PhD in law enforcement? Like, oh gosh, well, we really need you to really wish you had a gone through that, uh, you know, uh, the pottery course at the co local community college. Then you would have really been qualified. Mm -hmm. Very frustrating. But so I was still trying to become a cop at that time. And it wasn't until, you know, years later that I kind of just given up on it, mm -hmm. went into marketing, that I really started to confront just how jacked up police work was like the things that i used to do to people that like the way that i would just i would show up to somebody's bad day and make it worse yeah the way that i would show up to somebody's neutral day and make it a bad day because mm -hmm. i was bored you know i i think a, one thing that people really don't you know know about law enforcement is that there's a lot of terrible things that happen because cops get bored mm -hmm. we don't have it's a slow night. We got nothing to do, so we're gonna go drum something up. Yeah, we're gonna go bother people until we make something happen. You mm -hmm. know, and, and so it's like, I, when you're in it, law enforcement is such a cult. Like I mentioned, you know, I came in, I was hazed, I was threatened, I was mm -hmm. told, "You're not good enough to do this. We're gonna fire you if you don't get work, if you don't turn into an asshole." Mm -hmm. it, it's a cult, and it, and everybody that you know that is is there to protect you by the way like your fellow officer is the one that's going to save your life and they all in the police academy they show you video footage of cops getting killed in the, yeah. in the police academy every week we're watching dash cam footage of officers being murdered officers being shot in the head officers being ambushed right so it's drilled into your head everybody in the community wants to kill you law enforcement is a dangerous job everybody wants to kill you except for the guys in uniform next to you they're the only people that don't want to kill you uh -huh. take care of them 
And so that's what you do and mm -hmm. you take care of each other and you're the family and they, they know what's best and they know what's right. And, um, and so it's just, it's, it's really hard to be your own person in mm -hmm. law enforcement because if you are, they will beat it out of you. They will haze it out of you. Yeah. They will break you down and build you back up or they'll break you down and kick you out. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, it wasn't until I was out of law enforcement for a long time. And then I would tell a story, you know, one of my little cop stories people love to hear. And I would be telling the story that used to be funny to me about the time I did this or time I did that or a little time I was a little imp out there and was messing with somebody. And I would tell the story and then I'd be hearing myself tell it. And I'm like, man, that's fucked up. <laughs> it's like, wow, like, mm -hmm. I was just this, I was this state agent mm -hmm. that had unlimited power, the unlimited mm -hmm. power of violence. Yeah. And I just swooped in on an on a person minding their own business and just ruined their day. Like mm -hmm. and 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 it's nothing it was nothing to me. Mm -hmm. And I would do it and then I would go to Taco Bell and get a burrito and then mm -hmm. when I was full, I would go ruin someone else's day. Like mm -hmm. and it was nothing to me. Like I just it's when you're not in it anymore and you think about it, it just feels so different to mm -hmm. even just like I, I you know New York has what they call a stop and frisk policy that yep. gets talked about a lot. And it's, I, I still laugh now when I hear about that because I'm like the city that I worked in, we didn't have a stop and frisk policy. We just did it. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't name it, nothing. We just, we would go out and we would go, Hey, come here. And we start patting you down like, yeah. and, and just putting our hands in your pockets and asking you, hey, where are you going? What are you doing? And um, it never occurred to me until much later, like, wow that's so invasive yeah that this that this guy with a gun can just walk up to you while mm -hmm. you're on your way to the store on your way to work and go hey come here oh, empty your pockets what are you doing where are you going what's your name give me your id like mm -hmm. that's so um to just and and what can this person do like were those stops legal I mean, it's a gray area you know mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe not what could the, what was their recourse if it wasn't legal right what could this guy who, you know, may or may not even be in the country with documentation. What's he going to do if I stop him illegally and search his pockets illegally? What can he do? What recourse does he have? Nothing. Yeah. Nobody cares what happens to this guy. Mm. And so we just, you know, and I, I just, um, yeah, it's, it's the farther the every year that I put between me and being a cop, it was like another another scale would fall from my eyes and I would just be like, I would tell another story and be like, oh, wow, that was fucked up too. Oh, wow, that wasn't very funny for them. It was funny for me, but not for them. Wow. I used to have this prank I would do to people just to really piss you off. Okay. We would stop somebody and search their car, you know, looking for drugs or whatever. And if they were really, and here's what's the fucked up part. Okay. If they were really nice and they were really cool and we didn't find any drugs on them, I would sometimes take my backup gun and I would hide it in the car and then I would go, Hey, everything in this car is yours. Right. And the person would say, yeah, I go, you're not transporting anything for anybody else. Right. And they would go, no. And then I would reach in and I would pull out my own gun and I'd go, well, then what's this? And they would go, Oh, oh I don't know. I don't know. And I'd look at, it and I go, Oh, wait, that's just my gun. And I put it back in and we'd all have a good laugh. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Like, yeah, because I know other officers, we're planting things on people. Mm -hmm. And this person had no idea that I wasn't doing things that had happened to people that they knew. Yeah. Right. And so for me, it was the funny joke for them. It was like their whole life was flashing before their eyes. Mm -hmm. thinking like, Oh my God, am I about to get rolled up into something because this cop is corrupt. Right. Like, mm -hmm. you know, so like, to me, that was such a funny prank until you get out of it. And you're like, that's not funny at all. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Like, what a what a traumatic thing to do to somebody you know mm. but i thought i was giving them a good story that they were gonna tell but like mm. oh, oh my god like so yeah it's just it's stuff like that that um and just yeah in, in doing work with the community queer community and um particularly getting into leftist politics mm -hmm. and talking to more um black activists indigenous activists um you know uh border activists mm -hmm. uh you know things like that they would tell stories about their experiences with law enforcement and yeah. how about how traumatic they were 
and I'm remembering being on the other side of it, thinking it was just another day at the office. You know what I mean? And they would be like, yeah, and I thought this cop was going to kill me. And I was I was ready to I was trying to text my girlfriend from inside my pants, telling her goodbye, because I thought this cop was about to kill me. And I'm like, holy smokes, like I I had no idea. Like I had to hear it from these people that the terror and the dehumanization that that was the real one. It was just like how low police officers could make somebody feel how they could make people feel like scum just remembering times that i'd done that times that i'd called people names times that i'd you know been pissed off because they you know had loud music or something I'd, you you piece of shit you fucking people out here you don't know how to treat people you think you know it's just like i just never i had to hear it from a lot of other people to really understand how dehumanizing law enforcement was mm-hmm. yeah um yeah and i guess like i mean yeah that if that answered my uh follow-up question i guess <laughs> yeah i mean it, it's, sorry i'm just like i mean of course i know it's like a very personal thing i'm just like fascinated because it's like you i i guess like in leftist communities um you, you know you kind of hear I don't know, it's almost like um, sort of the opposite experience, like, you, you don't really hear, like, how that gets normalized, right? You kind of just have to assume, like, okay, like, these people, you know, have always been horrible, or, like, whatever, and it's just, like, but there's this entire, like, machismo culture, if you want to call it that, I, I don't know, like, what would be the correct term, but, like, of just, like, you know it's very military style i guess you know like you get beaten down and then you don't you either get through it and come out like as part of like the collective part of like you know the brothers and whatnot um or you're you know you're cast out um so yeah yeah i remember i was it was it was when i was on my little extra probation Mm -hmm. and i was i was trying i was trying real hard to be a tough cop i remember we were out on a call I don't, I don't remember what the circumstances were, but there was a drunk guy that was mouthing off to us. Mm-hmm. I think it was like a you know party call, and like, no big deal, right. no, no nothing on fire. All right. Some drunk guy, you know, was mouthing off to me, and I was getting all I was getting embarrassed because he was embarrassing me in front of the other cops, and I slapped him, <laughs> just jerk, mm-hmm. and and I arrested him for being drunk in public. And I thought, oh man, I'm gonna get in trouble. I should not have slapped this guy. Like mm-hmm. it, there was no, you know, there was no cause for use of force. Mm-hmm. Like maybe he was drunk in public. I could have, you know, I was, I was mm-hmm. on by my mind. Get so much trouble. Right. My sergeant came over and he was like, "Damn, good job. Finally, we're starting to see some fire in you. Thank good." Mm-hmm. Everybody, yeah, they, were, the other officers were praising me and clapping me for assaulting somebody. Yeah. Under color of authority, right? Mm-hmm. Like uh that was an illegitimate assault that was Mm -hmm. you know um uh, technically i should have been fired for that yeah technically and instead i was praised for it i you know yeah somebody bought me coffee that night you know what i mean Mm. i got yeah it's it's and that's not something that i had wanted to be i did not get into law enforcement Mm. hoping to slap around you know harmless people but and I worked with a ton of, I worked with a lot of officers that, you know, we, we were, that wasn't our base temperament. We were, we love to laugh and joke. We like to help people. We like to, um, you know, I, I, I loved finding city resources that I could put people in touch with to help mm-hmm. them out with certain issues that they had. Like I knew a lot of guys that I love to work with and that, that were really nice, really yeah. nice guys. But the city that we worked in, you were expected to, have a certain you were expected to perform a certain style of police work and you just you had to do it Mm -hmm. or you'd get in trouble or whatever but yeah it's yeah i think and and for sure there was a lot of people that got into law enforcement to hurt people like for sure there was a lot of people who loved it and Mm -hmm. that's what they were there to do and that was their little that was their little fetish was was just going out and beating people up and stuff like that but it's it's not law enforcement definitely attracts bad people but it also attracts well-meaning people who can get convinced very easily to do bad things yeah and not that that absolves any of us of the uh, yeah, things that we've of done but um but yeah there is a 
you, you have a, I have, one of the questions that you have down the way, I'll, I'll, I'll skip to, I'm, I'm taking over this interview, I'm hijacking oh, no. this interview, um, was, you know, do I think law enforcement culture can change? Mm-hmm. And I was, you know, when I looked at it, I was like, no, <laughs> no. no, it can't. Mm-hmm. And the reason is because this machinery that I'm describing is self-perpetuating. Right. There's no, there was no one guy that was the ringleader of the bad cops who mm-hmm. made me be a bad cop. It was, it was the cop, the racist cops in the sixties trained the racist cops in the seventies who trained the racist cops in the eighties who became my academy instructors and trained the trainers that trained me. And then I got onto the law. I got into law enforcement with the same guys that had been trained by that same legacy of racist mm-hmm. asshole cops. And this machinery just that's just what you did. And then mm-hmm. when I be when I got you know for a while in my early career, when we would have new officers come on, I would train them in the same way. I didn't haze them because I think hazing was stupid. Even mm-hmm. even when I was an asshole cop, I didn't haze people. But but I would get younger cops out there and I'd be come on, show some show some aggression come on get out there man they're gonna eat you live out here come on like so even i was perpetuating it and i didn't even like it mm-hmm. and so that's why i don't think the law enforcement culture where how would it be fixed unless mm-hmm. you create unless you split off every cop who's a cop right now and mm-hmm. split them out and hire all new people all new trainers mm-hmm. all new material now how are you going to do that mm-hmm. you know like how would you even do that so i just I think the machinery is too self-perpetuating. I yeah. think it's there's too much inertia and it's all there's no head to cut off, right? right? Like there's no there's no one person that's doing it. And so for me, yeah, I don't think law enforcement culture will change. I think you have I think you have to burn it down and put something new in its place. Yeah. And I think that's the only um, way. Me- metaphorically, burn it down, of course. Um, you know, YouTube. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, but no, like, and I, I guess that also, like, kind of speaks to uh, one of those further questions, yeah, about, like, it, even with when it comes to, like, and I, I even put, like, I put this long paragraph about, like, with all of these caveats, because it's like, even when I was writing, I was like, I, I really don't think this is, like, great, but, you know, it, it, it felt, like, important to ask, like, when it came to you know, like LGBTQ plus cops, and when it came to uh, racialized cops, and when it came to et cetera, et cetera, right? And yeah, I mean, like, of course, it's it's so self perpetuated. So I, I guess instead, I'll ask the more um, maybe useful question um, that's like kind of after that, which is like, and obviously, you know, specific circumstances require specific answers. Like, you know, that's guaranteed. But like, I guess like in the vague abstract way i guess um when it comes to people who are sort of in the police force and they're like you know i i don't like kind of in a similar situation of like i don't really know if i like this right like what what's kind of like you, you know like because you were of course in that like you know you were trying to join the police but it didn't really work and then you had a few years ahead of you like what's sort of like that again very vague abstract like pathway yeah, I mean, like, so I think of, you know, when I was in the academy, mm-hmm. uh, I was in the academy with about 50 other, 50 other um, trainees. Mm-hmm. And um, there was this little, this little click that formed in there of just the worst, just the worst. Mm-hmm. I mean, the worst people that you do not want in law enforcement. Yeah huge just um just mean like just mean people who abused the other trainees um always getting us in trouble always goofing off didn't take nothing serious um thought law enforcement was all about shooting guns and beating up bad guys and you know just and 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 all about uh very corrupt protecting each protecting each other kind right of thing you know blue wall of silence stuff they were already yeah. doing the academy they weren't even cops yet mm-hmm. and they were all they already had this click forming and the big um kind of the big uh symbol for that at the time in in los angeles police department was um 
the Rampart division. I don't know if you've heard of Rampart, but it was a it was a division in the Los Angeles Police Department where that division of cops basically became their own gang. To you know, mm. uh, unlike all the other law enforcement <laughs> cops, <laughs> unlike other cops cops that aren't gang <laughs> but um, they basically became like a full-on gang mm. they would go out they would find drug dealers rob them at gunpoint steal their drugs resell the drugs they would um raid drug houses steal the guns and the money and keep them to plant on other people or just keep the money um they shot and paralyzed the drug dealer um in an illegal search i mean rampart like the worst of the worst corruption right and um, like, so at the time that I was a trainee, I mean, that was sort of fresh mm-hmm. in our minds was that it had happened you know, kind of in the previous decade. And I saw this click forming and it just reminded me, I'm like, oh, great. Here's Rampart part two happening right. right in my police academy class. And so when we, in my academy class, we did um, peer evaluations. And so I wrote up a report on this click for my for my academy train uh, my academy instructors letting them know about this and saying hey i'm really concerned about this like um here's a bunch of things i've observed them do mm-hmm. this that and the other i feel like this is turning into a click it rem- i even said it reminds me of rampart um you know thinking i was thinking like oh i will bring this to the attention of the academy staff they will handle it right. they, they they will find this to be something worth handling mm-hmm. you know they're, maybe they're just kind of alienated from like that like they just don't really see it right yeah they didn't yeah. see it the way i saw it standing right. in line with these people so the thing is the academy evals that we did mm-hmm. they gave it to us on a worksheet that we were supposed to fill in by hand but they said we could type it if we wanted to okay so i type i typed up all of mine everybody else hand wrote theirs so what the academy staff did was they took in all of this click they brought them all in and then they plopped down my typed up report. And I was the only person in the class who typed up a report. So they didn't give my name, but they read but they my know. report verbatim to this group and said, is that true? And that group said, no, of course not. And the guys went, okay. And then they came back and, hey, or, oops, talk to myself. Uh, hey, Phil. I'll, I'll uh, pour it out or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know. Hey Phil, what the fuck? <laughs> you know? And I was like, "What do you mean?" And like, "Why did you write this horrible report calling us Rampart?" Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Uh oh." <laughs> <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so I, I tell you that story to tell you, like, I learned very early on. Oh, okay. If you if you see something, don't say something because mm-hmm. the people that you tell will narc on you to mm-hmm. the people that you're trying to narc on. Yeah. And so I got made fun of. Um, when we had fighting class, uh, you know, learning how to fight. Right. I'm pretty sure I got it a little bit rougher than some of the other people. Mm. Um, I was basically ostracized, um, mm. you know? And so I learned like, oh, okay, well, that's not an avenue for reform. Right. <laughs> so I just keep my mouth shut. And yeah. so that happens everywhere at every department. The people in charge do not want you to tell them about these problems because mm-hmm. Police unions are very strong. Police officers are notoriously difficult to fire. So the lieutenants, the captains, the chiefs, they don't want to know about it because they can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. So all you're doing is giving them a problem that they can't solve. So they don't Mm -hmm. want to hear it. And so it's just more paperwork. yeah, Yeah. So like I've known gay cops, I've known trans cops. I've known a ton of, um, black police officers. The city that I worked in was predominantly Hispanic. We had a ton of Hispanic cops that grew up in the area. Mm -hmm. There was nothing anyone could do to like change the culture at the police department. And in fact, the Hispanic cops that grew up in the area that we patrolled, they were some of the worst guys (laughs) because they had to prove that they were one of the good ones to Mm -hmm. the white cops. And so you would see Hispanic cops being horrible to Hispanic citizens to prove to the other white officers that they were one of them. You know, and so it was like, again, it was just this culture that reinforced itself and just perpetuated itself. And so, yeah, I have a lot of sympathy for um, people that wish they could, you know, I'm going to change it from the inside. I'm going to be one of the good cops. I'm going to change it from the inside. Like, 
Godspeed. I hope I hope so. Yeah. But how? Yeah. <laughs> it by by what mechanism are you going to change it from the inside because the whole machinery doesn't want to change. Mm-hmm. And and you are one person and they are mm-hmm. you know, I I worked with a probably what, I don't know, 75 cops at my department at one point. LAPD, what, 10,000 cops, New NYPD, 10,000 cops, whatever it is. Ten, tens of thousands of cops. What are you going to do? Yeah. Who are you going to tell? And there are and there are stories again and again and again of cops who narc on their fellow officers and then get fired. Mm-hmm. They oh, try yeah. to they try to reform it from within and they get drummed out of the business. There are cops who have been assassinated by their fellow officers for trying to narc on them. Mm-hmm. What are you going to do? Like, yeah. you know, so I just I just I believe you that you think you're going to change it from the inside. Right. Um, you just aren't. Yeah. You aren't. Um, Prove me wrong. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I, I guess like, because of course, um, you know, there are so many reasons why people join the police. Of course, there's the, you know, the, the glorification. There's maybe it's family. Maybe it's whatever. Right. Um, I imagine. I mean, again, I am not really like i don't i'm like very privileged in a lot of ways so um but like i imagine like poverty probably has something to do with it too so it's like but it's almost i feel like and i don't want to speak out my lane here but like I, i feel like almost when it comes to a lot of marginalized communities um sometimes i can give you a lot of like empathy um sometimes especially in america but i imagine in other places too um but again i don't um i don't know entirely but like there can be this sort of culture of like well i'm better now i got out of that so like what why are you guys sitting on your asses you know yeah Um, oh 100 percent um and we would we'd have some of the officers that grew up in the area and and law enforcement particularly in california very well paying without a college degree like Mm -hmm. There, there was at one point I was making over a hundred thousand dollars a year mm. with overtime and had, didn't have a degree, you know, entry level job. And so some of these people that grew up in these very, very poor communities, that was a great ticket to a pretty decent life. I mean, mm. I knew a guy, I knew a guy that he, he grew up in this very poor area, became a cop, um, saved his pennies, bought a house in kind of a, in kind of a rundown area that then got gentrified. He was able to sell his house and move into one of the richest communities in Orange County, mm. all on a cop salary, just because he'd kind of gotten lucky with where yeah. he'd bought his house. Something that it would have been unthinkable for any other person that he had ever grown up with to think that they could move to this very wealthy community that he had moved into. Yeah. And he, but he would sell him like, hey, I made it. Mm-hmm. I got out. I worked. I worked hard, kept my nose clean. Pulled myself up by my bootstraps. Yeah, pulled myself up by my bootstraps. Now I'm living in one of the richest communities in Orange County. Why aren't you? Mm. Which is an insane Mm. thing to say to somebody. (laughs) Like, you know, he got he got very and and to his credit, Mm -hmm. sure, he worked hard, Mm -hmm. but he got very, 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 very lucky. Yeah. And and he got very, very lucky because one of the things that we did to poor communities is we would saddle you with a record right you know what i mean so he got he was very lucky to have avoided getting a record Mm -hmm. in the same way that he was doing to other people when he was a cop because not just you can't get everyone to become a cop you know right yeah Yeah. god forbid (laughs) (laughs) um god yeah and like i don't even like i guess he would have had maybe um i don't know like a better sort of opportunity well maybe not then because it didn't really wasn't really around back then but nowadays you know could become a self-help youtuber so uh, absolutely oh yeah (laughs) you know just listen if you wake up at 5 a.m every day you know you're you know you just work hard um you know you can hashtag hustle yeah exactly get that bread (laughs) um which probably would have cost caused less harm but you know yeah um but yeah so I, i guess um and you've talked about this a little bit, but um, I guess kind of to dive like more like specifically in depth to it, like what was sort of the 
and I'm sure it was a gradual process, but like what was sort of the turning point that made you realize like queer people are like affected in particular and sort of how did you get that opportunity to speak to them and like, um, yeah, I, I guess that was kind of the question. Well, there were two, uh, I mean, there are two instances that I remember from even being in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was just um, our gang unit had made a traffic stop on a car full of, you know, gangster looking people. Mm -hmm. So, so they thought or whatever whatever it was they'd stop this car and it was a car with four uh trans women in it that happened mm. to be driving through our city to go go clubbing or whatever um but it was four trans women and the cops were just the, the my you know my partners at the time were just horrible <laughs> it's horrible to these to these trans women who were doing nothing wrong by mm -hmm. the way they got stopped on a pretext stop for looking for guns or drugs mm -hmm. and you know um you know drugs maybe sure but i don't know a lot of armed trans women you know like should that, be that's more but no. <laughs> hey, hey believe me mm -hmm. i'm all in favor of arming the trans but uh, um but yeah they got stopped they were obviously not up to no good they were mm -hmm. obviously just normal people doing normal stuff on a friday saturday night mm -hmm. but they cops were just calling them names mm -hmm. just being just, uh, you know it's just the, the, what you would expect from yeah. a bunch of meathead cops dealing with trans women um making fun of them going through mm -hmm. their phones looking for nude pictures and stuff like that showing mm -hmm. each other uh, you know just you know and just horrible stuff and i just remember even at the time uh i you know i wasn't sort of openly queer or even right. open to myself about that really and um, but even at the time, I was just like, man, this is, come on, like, this is, mm -hmm. we don't need to do this, right? Like, these, are, these aren't bad guys, right? right. Like, these aren't bad people, like, we don't need to do this. And, you know, that's one that stuck out to my head. And, but the, but the one that really stands out to me was we uh, got a call, uh, another officer on my shift got a call of a, um, an assault. And mm. I happened to be, I wasn't assigned to the call, but, uh, Basically, in law enforcement, somebody calls in and says, hey, I had a, a crime happen or whatever. Somebody gets assigned as the primary officer. They get to make all the decisions. And then other units are their backup mm -hmm. and are just there to make sure that they don't get beat up or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, but it's the primary officers. He, they make all the decisions about, is this a crime? Do I take a report? What do I do? Mm -hmm. you know, how do I handle this? And so another officer got assigned to be the primary on this. I was just bored. Like I mentioned, a lot of law enforcement happens when you're bored. Mm -hmm. I was driving around bored. I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll show up and back this guy on this call. Well, it turns out it is a it was a trans woman who was doing sex work, got assaulted by a client when they, what, you know, mm -hmm. they discovered, they suddenly discovered that they didn't want to be around a trans right. person anymore. Trans panic. Trans panic, yeah. Yeah. And uh, basically, uh, I think just to kind of kind of hit this woman a little bit, kind of thumped her a little bit and mm -hmm. then ran away mm -hmm. so um as assaults go not the worst one i've seen but you know this woman was legitimately assaulted yeah. and wanted to make a report yeah and police officers hate taking police reports and they will make any they will make any excuse in the book not to what they would call take paper you know mm -hmm. and uh, not write a report and so this officer i'm out with this officer as he's conducting his investigation he determines that this was happening during sex work and so in order to get out of taking the report that he didn't want to do because he wanted to go do something more exciting he said well if you try to press charges um i'll arrest you for being a prostitute how about that so why don't you just let it go he didn't kill you right uh you were doing something bad anyway so you kind of got what you deserved so call it luck that you didn't get killed, stop being a prostitute. And if you push the issue, I'm gonna take you to jail. And, you know, I'm out there and I'm just like, I'm listening to this and I'm just like, oh my God, like, I cannot believe this. And I'm watching this poor woman is just very upset by this. Mm -hmm. And so I, I pulled him aside and go, hey, uh, why don't you let me take handle? Then let me take primary on this. He's yeah. like, what? I was like, why don't you let me take primary? Um, I think I made something up like, yeah, I've been doing some, um, I've been doing some extra training. I want to work on, I want to work on my report writing for right. this kind of thing. 
Um, I've been, I've been, I actually had been working on some sex trafficking. So, hey, I've been working on some sex trafficking. Why don't you let me take this mm-hmm. for my own training? I'll, I'll take the handle on it. Don't worry about it. And he's mm-hmm. like, are you sure? Really? You know, like really f- for her, you know, kind of thing. And I was yeah. like, yeah, yeah, I got, I got it. Let me, it's fine. Hey, go, go get a coffee. Go, go do your thing. Mm-hmm. You know? So I, I sent him away and I, I took her report and I, I took it as an assault. And I, you know, I, I think I even gave her a ride home because she was, it was at a motel. Yeah. Um, gave her a ride home and Hey, sorry about that. And, and, and took a report and, and I knew nothing was going to come of this. Right. Mm-hmm. Like I knew they weren't going to be able, a, if they even, if the detectives even cared, yeah, they weren't going to find this guy who was probably, you know, an, an anonymous John or whatever he's yeah. like, fake name, but you know, it's just like, Hey, uh, you're a human being. You got assaulted here. Let me validate that with this mm-hmm. police report you know it's a small nothing but i just remember giving her ride home she's very grateful and um and suspicious by the way yeah of course suspicious why all of a sudden there was the nice cop you know doing something nice for her. right um but uh i just i was really um kind of heartbroken by that interaction and i mm-hmm. i even the next the next day during briefing I said, hey, I have a topic I want to bring up. And so the sergeant said, yeah, go ahead. And I said, hey, you know, we were on this call with this trans person who is a sex worker who got assaulted. Um, I just want to let you know if if you <laughs> if you blow victims like this off, we can get sued, right? Mm-hmm. Like I just I'm I'm telling you guys, I whatever your personal discomforts with these kinds of things are, like trust me, I'm I I keep up with these issues. We can get sued and fired if we blow off victims of crimes like this, mm-hmm. which was sort of half true. Like, yes, in a theoretical perfect world, you could get sued and fired for that. But, but yeah, realistically, was that ever going to happen? No. But I, I just say, hey, you know, so if you have a problem with it, like, call me over, okay? Like, mm-hmm. I don't want anybody to get sued. So if you're, if it's just not something that you can take seriously, call me over. I will take it for you to avoid this department getting into any trouble. But please, like, just take it seriously protect your jobs protect the department you know i, I put it in like hey, a very let's protect yeah, yeah. the department right yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but really it's just like i was so mad at how this poor trans woman had been treated you know um and so the, those were kind of the two incidents for me that really um i would say like on the job clarified that like wow uh queer people just do not get treated very well mm-hmm. <laughs> you know yeah. um and then there were a couple other ones. There was I was out on a couple domestic incidents between um, uh, two men, and then another one on two women. And the officer was trying to get out of taking the report because well, it's two women. I mean, it's not really domestic violence, right? right. And I was like, yeah, it really is domestic violence. You fucking asshole. But like, um, but yeah, that was, was just it was something that I saw a few times where somebody's status as a queer person was used to shunt them off to the side you don't get you know you don't get protection from the state you don't get regard from the state because you're queer uh i I can't remember who who said this quote but they said you know i think it was you know conservatism or really neoliberalism Mm. um requires people who the law protects but does not bind and people who the law binds but does not protect and i saw that happen again and again to the queer community the law bound them yeah you know if they were sex workers if they were drug addicts if they were in a mental health crisis the law bound them arrested them got them a record beat them up but did not protect them when they were Mm -hmm. the victims of crimes and so um and then as they got into queer activism you know that was that's something that i have to just be cool with is when i say hey i used to be a cop instantly yeah i lose i lose some trust with people instantly mm-hmm. and you know that i'm gonna say it doesn't hurt my feelings but like i get it like yeah and it's valid and i will never ever fault somebody if i tell you i used to be a cop and that's that's it for you i totally understand mm-hmm. um that is an earned <laughs> that is yeah. an earned response and i will never criticize somebody for having that response because yeah. because i get it because I get it and I know, and I'm just trying to do my part to fix mm-hmm. it, fix it in post as it were. Yeah. But um, yeah. Uh, I don't know why I was reminded by this, but I was, I remembered an earlier comment you made about how um, 
I, I guess like um, when it comes to people again being messy not fitting into like perfect neat boxes you talked about of course um, or briefly mentioned like sort of there's not like a perfect victim right um and i find i mean with like for instance the me too movement right um you know a lot of people like a lot of the sort of very big names like you know if they do nothing wrong and whatnot and you know everything is like you know, they have tons and tons and tons of documents and records and all of that, you know, like, they may get t- um, treated seriously. Yeah. But, like, a lot of, um, a lot of when a lot of these allegations come up, it's like, well, you know, if, I mean, for instance, yeah, like, some um, survivors, you know, have done, like, sexual assault or sexual harassment before, right? Or maybe they've just done a crime. Maybe they just said something mean on Twitter, you know, like... Um, but you know it's like an easy like dismissal of like a you know oh well you know i don't have to take you seriously right um and i don't know maybe i was just reminded by the whole like you know like i can like shunt you into this sort of like non-person non-citizen sort of um you know like you still have to deal with the consequences but like you know you i'm not going to take any of your concerns seriously um yeah i there was i was uh I used to take my friends on ride-alongs mm-hmm. and, um, you know, and just uh, show them the city. You know, so, you know, of course, I grew up sheltered, you know, mm. rich, rich, rich town, white boy. So all my friends were from there, too, you know. So mm. we'd t- take them on a little poverty tourism on a ride-along or whatever. But I remember one night I had a friend that was doing a ride-along with me, and we stopped a guy um, who, you know, looked like a gangster because, mm. you know, because... <laughs> We define looking like a gangster as like looking like you're from the city that we were in. Yeah. And um, you know, we stopped this guy and he had a meth pipe in mm. his pocket. And had a little residue. And that's an arrestable offense. Yeah. Friend. And so but I had my I had my friend who's right along and I even at that time I wasn't I wasn't gonna, you know, make a big deal out of a pipe. You know, it's mm-hmm. kind of that's not something that really uh I felt the real need to come bring the hand of justice down on so uh, since i had my friend there and i was like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna educate my friend a little bit uh you know look like a cool guy and so i told the guy I said, hey so you've got this pipe it's got a little bit of residue in it i could arrest you for this but i will lose this pipe in exchange i want you to tell us how you got onto meth and he was like really and i was like yeah if you tell me your story i will lose this pipe mm-hmm. and uh and so I, I asked him i said okay so here's my real question for you and I was actually being sincere, and I really wanted to know this. So, you know, uh, law enforcement, freaking, you know, th- threatening aura aside, you know, I really was sincere about this question. Mm. I said, "So, look, you, you grew up in this area, right?" And he said, "Yeah." I said, "Did you know people that got addicted to meth when you were a kid?" And he mm-hmm. said, "Yeah." And I said, "Did you think that they were living a real cool life after they got into meth?" And he was like, "No." I go, "Like, did you have family members that like?" got really into some bad scenarios because they're addicted to meth and he said yeah and i said so why the fuck mm-hmm. are you doing meth mm-hmm. like i don't like please help me understand like and he said look i get it he's like but i was at a party months ago and everybody was doing it and i didn't want to be the only guy not doing it so i did it and now i'm doing meth mm-hmm. and i go okay fair enough and i you know tossed the pipe and sent him on his way but that was something that really stuck with me is that this guy who is a meth head you mm-hmm. know that we we put off into the meth head box he knew better yeah right he knew better he had family members that had been victimized by this lifestyle and yet he was still doing it because of this circumstance that he mm. was in and it was in the community and it was part of you know part of his friend group and you know i i could take that to be oh what an idiot right but instead i was like oh how tragic mm-hmm. that this guy who knew better was in a it was in a cultural milieu that that he still ended up on this path that he knew was a dead end path Mm -hmm. and actually i kind of broke my heart and i felt a lot of compassion for that and so i think about that when you hear people online talking about oh he's a drug addict he's a fucking druggie Mm -hmm. like yeah well you know some people (laughs) some people didn't have your great upbringing some Mm -hmm. people maybe you were just built different but like yeah sorry wow yeah. yeah Yeah, God forbid you grew up yeah. where all of your friends were doing something, you know, where you didn't have a dad, you didn't have any other resources. And so the people that were your community 
had this part of it, you know, I'm like, you know, lucky you that that wasn't you, but it actually gave me a lot more compassion for mm. the, you know, the idea of like these sort of imperfect, imperfect victims, imperfect, yeah. imperfect suspects too, you know, like, mm -hmm. like, wow, like this, this guy didn't really have a great shot. <laughs> We did not arm this guy with all of the tools necessary to not mm -hmm. have this lifestyle, you know? So, yeah. You know. Um, so I guess, um, so, uh, yeah, I, I guess, like, this is sort of a slight switch, but, like, um, I think in actually the first video that, like, I was really introduced to you by, because I think you, um, I was like, hey, you know, like, because you were asking to... I think like get a quote or two from some people, um, um, some non-binary people, and I was like, hey, you know, I'm here. But, <laughs> um, but your video um, about non-binary beauty, um, you came out at least in that video, you know, in the sort of your YouTube persona, whatever, um, as bisexual. Um, so like, I, I guess, yeah. What I don't know, you know, it, you could tell me if like nothing's happened or whatever. But like, has there been any pushback, or even like outside of that, has there been any sort of like what's been kind of like that situation uh not really mm -hmm. um i think i mean I, I i like to think i've cultivated a pretty chill yeah pretty chill audience <laughs> um i i i tend not to attract the uh kind of people that like to fight yeah um but also like i don't know i think i i I don't, I don't, I guess I don't think I've ever really had an audience that would have ever cared about that for one. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that like, I, I think I wouldn't say I get pushed back, but I know there's some um, I don't know, suspicion is the right word, but like, uh, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a hetero marriage, right? Like, mm. I'm, um, yeah, you know, and so I'm not, you know, I, I know there's this kind of idea of like, queer stolen valor mm. where you know particularly sometimes when people get in trouble online they're like oh actually i'm not binary and pan you know like like okay like there's there's a sense sometimes people get accused of like faking these mm. you know or being pol being politically non-binary when they get in trouble so that right. they can get out of you know dodge an issue or whatever and so i know there's some like suspicion about my queer bona fides mm. uh but it, it's not it's not something that I get that I hear about a lot. Yeah. Um, when I I was why when I started my YouTube channel I was wise, and I started it as a white man, and so I tend not to get as much pushback as people that who foolishly started a mm. YouTube channel. <laughs> you made wise choices as a you know, being born a white guy. <laughs> Yeah, with the audacity of not being a white man, I know mm. they tend to get it a little bit worse than I do. But yeah, I don't. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I've gotten almost you know universal yeah applause for coming out or whatever. Um, yeah, I I oh sorry. Yeah, no, no, so oh, yeah. it's just, it's not something. But I'm not I'm not like out out in my in my like day to day life right. per se. I I would say I'm not like super hiding it like mm -hmm. if you know anything about anything and you look at the backpack that i take into the office sometimes you'd be like oh okay but <laughs> um but you know it's kind of one of those little wink and a nods for yeah. the, the people who you know if you know you know and yeah you look at my backpack you're like oh, okay but like i'm not like walking into work meetings going like bisexual disaster here you know like i'm not like out 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 about yeah. it but also i'm not like mm. super closeted either yeah it's not something that I'm in a position, I guess, where it's not something that I need to be front and center mm -hmm. in my AFK life. Mm -hmm. And um, so much of my relationships and my my work and my hobbies now are online. So, mm -hmm. you know, everybody that needs to know about it knows about it online. People in my real life that need to know about it know about it in my real life. And, yeah, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, I, I think personally like i've been kind of in a sort of i guess that kind of privileged position of like if i ever get any like pushback like in real life about like queerness it's about like trans stuff right i really don't get um now if like i came out to like my grandma or something that would be a different story um 
you know, and we'll see how that goes in a few months as I graduate. But, um, you know, with a different, um, you know, a different name and all of that than she's <laughs> used to. Um, but like, um, yeah, like, it, I, I guess I'm sort of in this strange position because like, I want to like, I hear a lot about um, biphobia and like the kind of, um, you know, yeah, like we we love bi people, you know, if they're in a you know queer relationship, right? Um, <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You know, if you're in a heterosexual relationship, you know, um, and of course, you know, there's the whole bi people are just greedy or very all polyamorous. Which, granted, if you're polyamorous, you know, like, hey, you know, that's awesome. But like, it, it's like sort Can't of just decide. like. Um, yeah, it's like this negative stereotype, nonetheless. Um, and yeah, or you know, you're trying to maintain privilege or whatever. Um, and like, I've not personally, and again, it might just be because there's like a lot of queer people in my very specific like niche of a like location. Um, but like, uh, I mean, not that like you know we're having like a pride down the street, but like you know, it, it, there's a lot of people that like you know you're like, oh hey, I'm queer, and they're like, oh yeah, me too. Um, so. <laughs> I'm kind of lucky in that regard, but I, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I'm glad there hasn't been pushback, um, so I guess, like, a more useful question, then, um, might be, like, um, how did you sort of go about, like, cultivating that more accepting, progressive, even just, like, not going to make, like, a big fuss about it, like, sort of audience, you know, like, how did you make the audience you wanted to make and have, assuming? Well, this, I mean, it's funny, because to some extent, the and you know this like trying to build an audience online is so random mm -hmm. and it's all luck you yeah. know every any big youtuber that you see with a big subscriber big subscriber count i mean i'm telling you it's luck mm -hmm. i mean not not that there aren't content creators that are working very very hard but course, like but, yeah. you and i both know mm -hmm. a million content creators that are working their butts off mm -hmm and they get 300 views if they're lucky right like right we, you know they, they've got 50 subscribers you know and that that was a hard one 50 right and so right. it's like there's a ton of people working really really hard and so you know the big channel is just it's it's a lot of luck it's you know somebody with some clout sees a video and decides to share it and you know i'm lucky that thought slime shared one of my videos and that's mm -hmm. why that's why i have a big audience um uh but um, so, like, on the one hand, you know, it's hard to say I've culted, you know, I, I certainly have not handpicked <laughs> all my subscribers and commenters. On the other hand, I think, I think what I've tried to do with my channel from the beginning is to be, I mean, the number one posture that I try to assume with my channel is curiosity. Mm. Um, I started making videos because I was reading interesting things and wanted to talk about them, yeah. things that made me curious. And so um, if you get nothing else out of my channel, I think you at least come here and go, oh, okay, this is somebody who's curious to learn about things. Mm -hmm. And that is not a universal posture on mm, YouTube sure. and on TikTok and on anywhere else. There's a lot of people who want to use their platform to project something to right. tell you something um yeah to to um to really narrow the discussion right like and i think this is what's, sorry this is what's important this is what this is what i think this is what's yeah. true you know what i mean go ahead yeah and i was just gonna say like i think i think even um <laughs> You know, if anyone's watching this on my YouTube channel, um, they'll know that there's been a little bit of a gap um, from my... And it's, I, I think when I've been very critical of my past videos, and which kind of... I mean, also with just school and everything, but, you know, like, I've been very, like, just rethinking the whole, like, way I'm doing it. I think I've, like, even fallen into that problem a bit of just, like... I, I wanted to make something... Like, I wanted to make something educational... But I kind of accidentally sort of cut off a lot of the discussion when I have had and have so much to learn. And I think, like, moving forward, I definitely want to, like, try to progress more into that sort of 
things are a lot more open and a lot less like, oh, here's the 101. Here's like the basics of everything you need to know. I mean, I literally have a have a series called uh, Everything You Need to Know About Trans People. And oh boy, I have a lot of critiques of that <laughs> series, right? It's just like, I, I think, yeah, I mean, it's something I definitely admire. It's just that like, it's really important to kind of be open to that sort of, you know, I'm not, I don't know everything. Yeah, and so, yeah, so, when you come to my channel, I, I, the kinds of videos that I do are things like, hey, here's something I'm learning. Mm -hmm. You know, here's something I'm learning about. I found this really interesting. Well, you know, and if you notice at the end of my videos, um, it's not just to drive engagement, but I would say, what do you think? Like, mm -hmm. what do you think about all this? I try to ask a question. Ha have you had experience with this? What do you, what, you know? And so I invite, you know, um, it's a common, you know, don't. It's a common trope on the internet. Like, don't read the comments. Like, watch out for the comments. YouTube comment mm. section is the worst place in the world. Yeah, it can be, but it's that's why I try better. to invite. Yeah, and mm. that's why I try to invite. Like, hey, please comment, but mm. comment something interesting. Tell tell the people what you think about all this. And so, mm. I try to I try to prompt positive discussion in the comments, and also, um, you know, I try to admit on my channel when I'm wrong or confused about something or when I, I try to say like hey I don't really know about all this or mm -hmm. wow I really thought this but then I had this experience with somebody and wow that really changed the way I think about things so you don't come to my channel to find the security of certainty that you are morally right mm -hmm. and that all of your ideological enemies are ontologically evil you know what I mean like you don't yeah. get that from my channel right mm -hmm. like you come here because you're curious because you are interested in the topic because mm. you want to think about it and discuss it with other people and you're not going to get from me a personality of domination and i'm not i'm not ever going to destroy someone with facts and logic i'm mm. not ever going to obliterate my opponents mm. um that's just not my that's not my style mm -hmm. and so i think and i know i have i know i have crossover Mm -hmm. with certain audiences that will remain nameless i know i have crossover with certain i should say creators that mm -hmm. shall remain nameless i know i have a, a crossover with them mm -hmm. but when those when that audience comes onto my channel they don't start shit in the comments mm -hmm. you know what i mean and so it's a very different space yeah it's just uh, you know and, and if i saw it i would you know that's the other thing that i do too is if i see people you can shadow ban or ruckus, you can delete their comment yeah. or you can yeah 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 i, I hide people all the time that, mm -hmm. Well, not all the time because it doesn't happen very often because yeah. you're not going to get you're not going to get what you want out of it on mm -hmm. my channel you just aren't and so that's I, it, so to answer your question i try to cultivate that by being the kind of com by being the kind of audience i want to have right and by by i guess leading by example or whatever but just like if you're vibing on my wavelength mm -hmm. you're probably not here to start a big ruckus you're probably here to have an interesting thought experiment or an interesting mm -hmm. um maybe something you hadn't thought about before or, or yeah. a book you, you you know an idea you hadn't encountered before and i think on my channel we find it exciting to think a thought we've never thought before yeah. and i know for other people that's scary yeah and when i was a conservative christian it was really scary to to hear something outside of what was natural and normal and what was safe and comfortable. Mm -hmm. That was very scary because, because if I was wrong over here, I could, then I mean, I'm wrong over here. And if I'm wrong over here, did that mean this is wrong? And then the whole house of cards falls down mm -hmm. on my channel. That's, there's no house of cards. We don't, we don't know nothing. We're just, we're all <laughs> trying to figure it out. So mm -hmm. it's um, on my channel. It's exciting to hear something new and yeah. maybe we don't agree with it and maybe it's weird or we don't fully understand it but it's not threatening yeah on my channel it is not threatening to hear something that you don't understand it's interesting and it's mm. exhilarating and and that's what i've tried to cultivate and so far it seems to be working yeah. it also helps that i only have sixteen thousand subscribers which is a small yeah it's a very small group on yeah. youtube i don't have a million subscribers i'm sure if i had a million subscribers you know you can't you can't all... like in, yeah. not even cultivate but you can't even like yeah have a At that point of... it's out of your hands yeah <laughs> so i've just i've done my part to be the mm. kind of person i want to see on youtube and that's all i can do mm. yeah i so i had more 
in-depth questions because we're running a little bit low on time. I'm going to ask the kind of my final one. Um, and I've got, I've got um, at least another half hour if you want. So um, don't, yeah, don't I mean, rush on my account. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Do your thing. Still, I'll ask this just because it might be a bigger discussion anyway. Um, sure. So, I guess um, something I'm interested in um, is you know, like, kind of, what's your advice for people who, and again, different situations, all that, but what's sort of your advice for people who want to, not for YouTube, but uh, though it can be, um, but not everyone can become a YouTuber, of course, um, but what's your advice for kind of getting into ad activism, advocacy, like, even just, like, you know, connecting with communities and building up stuff, like, what sort of, you know, either with your experience or stuff you've read and whatnot, like what's, what are some of those like really good, like, um, hey, we need more people down here and this is really interesting um, kind of thing? Yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough question because like, mm. so, you know, I'm fortunate to have found a, um, you know, an, an AFK or I keep saying away from keyboard. <laughs> Because uh, I was reading that book, Glitch Feminism, uh, and Legacy Russell. Mm. She I said, really she says, need to read that. Yeah, she's, she rejects using the term IRL because she's like, online is real life. Mm -hmm. like, there's no difference between online and offline. They're both real life. So she says yeah. AFK, and it's gotten a habit of doing that. I guess but she would I, I not was... be a fan of uh, Touch Grass and all that. Um... Uh, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. Um, but, you know, I was very fortunate to find a um, a an active, you know, uh, this, this queer teen outreach mm -hmm. in my city that I physically go to out of my house, mm -hmm. you know, out in meat space. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate to have that. And it's good. It's good for me because my natural inclination is to sit. You, you see me in this box. My natural inclination, you would never not see me in this box mm -hmm. at all times, playing games, writing scripts, filming videos, mm -hmm. listening to music, writing music, talking to people, having relationships. I, I would do it all right here on this screen if I could. And so mm -hmm. it's good for me to have a space that I'm compelled to leave the house. Yeah. Um, and I'm fortunate to have that. And I found that because after the, uh, after the 2016 elections, I don't know if you heard about them, but um, <laughs> uh, I was a little angry mm -hmm. after the 2016 elections i was a little frustrated mm -hmm. and i had all this nervous energy that i mm -hmm. needed to get out yeah and my first idea was like all right they're gonna elect they're gonna elect a fascist to be president you know my idea was i was gonna start a um self-defense club for queer people <laughs> okay like, all right if that's what we're doing yeah then you know, I used to train martial arts. I trained police officers in martial arts. I trained civilians in martial arts. Um, like, okay, if that's what we're doing, I'm going to start training people to fight, because, mm -hmm. you know, because apparently that's what this has come to, you know? Yeah. And gradually realized I didn't really, I didn't have a plan. You know, I didn't, I didn't yeah. know how to organize something like that. And so I decided to join this, um, you know, queer teen outreach just to have something to do with this mm -hmm. energy. Like I got to, do something with this. I got. I want to go out and help people. I want to go out and do something. I was sort of coming to grips with my bisexuality at the time. I was completely alienated from the queer community just because of my upbringing. So that was sort of my way of like, okay, how do I get plugged in to this community of people? How do I learn from them and stuff like that? So that was something that for my, where I was at in life, this group was here mm -hmm. and it worked for me. Obviously everybody would have kind of different, right? You know, depending on where you are, you might not have something like this. Depending on where you are, you might have 50 things like this. Yeah. You, know? you have your choice, I don't know. Uh, you know, so my, I guess my first advice would be like, to the extent that you can, it's really good to get out in fresh air every once in a while, meet real people, not the people online are not real, but like, okay, let me real people meet people in the community in which they need help. Yeah. I guess is was what I mean is like meet people where they are and ask them how can I help? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, 
is that's my biggest advice is to ask people how they want to be helped. If, mm -hmm. if not, if you hear nothing else from this piece of advice, um, ask people. I mean, and that this came out of my background in marketing. Mm -hmm. Really bad marketers tell you what they want to tell you. Really good marketers find out what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. In both in ways that are both good and bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, but really good marketers, you know, when we were when we were marketing safety equipment what we did was we went to our customers and we said hey what are you struggling with mm -hmm. what do you need help with and like hey we really need help with how to do a proper fit test on a mask our people don't know how to do it but great we'll put together a flyer for you on how to do just that you know mm -hmm. what i mean and so that's to me that's an example of positive marketing where we went out and said hey what's a problem that you have you tell us then we solve it for you right that's activism 101 to me like who What's a community that you want to help? Is it uh, the unhoused? Great. Ask them what they need. Yeah. Don't just show up with uh, a bunch of cans of soup and go, oh, here's the soup you probably need. <laughs> Ask them, do they need soup? Mm -hmm. They probably need socks. You know, like, yeah. They probably need you know, uh, things you hadn't thought of because you're not unhoused. Right, yeah. So um, you know, get out there and ask people what they need. Um, there's a podcast that I listened to, uh, the judge John Hodgman podcast where he, it's a, it's a comedy podcast where he, he, he pretends to be a fake judge and he adjudicates very petty personal disputes. Okay. Really funny. <laughs> but one of his, uh, one of his John Hodgman's axioms is, um, help in the way that you are asked to help. Um, because one of the things that he gets into is a lot of times, um, this will surprise you. There's a lot of husbands and wives that come on the show to complain about their spouse. Right. And one of the things that husbands have a tendency to do is when the wife asks the husband to help out with a project, the husband will decide that he knows better about how to help mm. and will do something that he was not asked to do and then get mm. not understand why that was not met with gratitude. Mm -hmm. So jo John Hodgman has this axiom, help in the way that you are asked to help. Yeah. Well, the only way that you will know how you are asked to help is to go ask, how can I help? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's a big piece of advice. Um, the other thing too is I, I think, um, particularly with like building an online community or or doing things um, on YouTube or TikTok or Discord or whatever, mm -hmm. is um, I think when I first started my channel, I was watching a lot of philosophy tube at the time. Yep. And so if you watch my very first video, it is me doing my best to be Abby Thorne, right? Yeah. It's, it's me doing my best Abby Thorne impression. Mm -hmm. And so, which is fine. We all, we all. That, that's know, like a necessary to... stage, I think, of being a YouTuber. You yeah. gotta, you, all gotta, you gotta emulate someone's start. Yeah. And so, um, you know, you gotta start somewhere. But, you know, over time, I found my own, I found what I have to bring to the table. And so right. I have a background in marketing. I have a background in law enforcement. I have mm -hmm. a background in design and web design and i have mm -hmm. a background in um training under interpersonal communication and uh training in um conflict resolution i have a background in mediation mm -hmm. you know through through all of my different kind of professional things and so these are things i'm like oh, okay here's something that i know a lot about that i can add to the discussion and mm -hmm. i can bring something that uh is from me and, and something that i have an expertise in and everybody's got different expertise and maybe you don't have an expertise but you have a subject that you're really passionate about and that you're learning about i think it's really great to have somebody to have a channel where somebody says hey i don't know anything about this so i'm reading this book and here's what i've learned from the book that's mm -hmm. great i love that and mm -hmm you will always i think you will always do a better job being sincere and being credible and being um, persuasive and being personable if you're talking about something that you're passionate about yeah and you can really tell what uh, you know we've all seen it we know when somebody is doing a video that they on a topic just to get engagement and not yeah. something that they actually care about yeah. we all know what it looks like when somebody's trying to ride an algorithm wave when mm -hmm. somebody is trying to catch a trend we all know what that I mean, feels yeah like. i mean i've done it before and you we've know? all done it yeah <laughs> we've all done it um but the things that get 
an audience excited is mm. um, when you're passionate. You yeah. the excitement and the passion that you bring to something, and it doesn't have to be like woo excitement, but just like the sincerity that you bring mm. to something. You cannot fake it. You yeah. cannot fake passion and sincerity and um and, and and just that that personal love. And so that's my I always encourage people like build build something that you love because then that is infectious to people. People find passion infectious. Like one of my little um you know when I'm when I'm just eating lunch on a on a lunch break, I watch sometimes I watch somebody document the history of a speed run for like mm. Mario or Dark mm -hmm. Souls or uh, Summoning Salt, I think. Summoning Salt, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I know no, speedrun. I'm terrible at video games. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I've never done speedrunning in my life. Mm -hmm. But summoning salt mm -hmm. gets me freaking passionate about yeah. getting to the sub the sub fifty nine second <laughs> run of whatever, right? Like uh he he makes me passionate about uh or Carl Carl Jopes too. They mm -hmm. get me passionate about the Quake speedrun community. Mm -hmm even though I've never speed run quick, right? Like mm -hmm. it's just infectious like, yeah. and, and you cannot fake it. And so it's, that's my advice to people trying to start something is don't try to fake it. Don't try to be something that you think other people want. Mm -hmm. Don't try to guess what the audience, you will never guess what the YouTube audience wants. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a video last year that I thought for sure, I'm like, okay, this one's gonna go viral. It's about Dark Souls. It's about yeah. liminal spaces. The internet cannot get enough of Dark Souls or liminal spaces. This thing is going to blow up. It didn't blow up. It, a thousand people watched it. Whatever. It's fine. Um, I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm grateful, but I thought for sure that one was going to hit 10K. And mm -hmm. it didn't. It just didn't. And it probably won't. I guess, whatever. Um, and that's I'll fine. Say, I enjoyed it, but I, yeah, I, I get I know, it. It's one of my I favorites. But it's it's one that I was really passionate about. Mm -hmm. It's one that I loved doing. And it just didn't reach the audience I thought it was going to reach. And then I had another one about George Carlin that reached double the people. Mm -hmm. I have no idea why. Mm -hmm. George Carlin is not in the zeitgeist right now. Mm -hmm. George Carlin is not part of the algorithm right now. But for some reason, the George Carlin video did way better than the Dark Souls video. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why that happened. You will never predict it. Mm -hmm. Stop trying to predict it. Don't worry about it. Just do shit that you care about. Mm -hmm. Do shit that is exciting to you and just let it and you know what, if, if, if I never get another subscriber, great. I'm mm -hmm. really happy with, I'm really happy with the audience that I have. I'm really happy that if even one person is like, wow, that really changed my mind about that. Thank you. Hell yeah. What, what more can you ask for in life yeah. than to persuade, than to persuade a couple of people? Like mm -hmm. what more can you really ask for mm -hmm. than to, to, or just to be someone's you know, everybody is someone else's comfort YouTuber, right? Mm -hmm. Like somebody is watching you on their lunch break because you're their little comfort content creator. What more can you ask for? You right. just, you could be happy with that. Like you could be happy with, with what you got. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that fully answers all of your no, questions. I, I mean, but like, yeah. That's... It's just, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to, um, you can't brute force it. You cannot yeah. brute force a channel. You cannot brute force activism. You mm. cannot brute force um, a community. Mm. You know what I mean? Like you cannot brute force this stuff. You have to, it's, there's a great quote. I don't know who said it. Um, I, I think I saw it as like a plaque that somebody had up at their organizing space, but it mm -hmm. said, um, everybody wants revolution, but nobody wants to do the dishes. Mm. 100%. I, lo yeah. I love that quote because it's so true. We all want the big, everybody wants the big viral video. We mm -hmm. all want the big bombastic uh, revolution. We all want the big protest. The, the big the, event, you know, you know V yeah. revolution, V yeah, we, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. We all want the thing, but nobody wants to wash the dishes. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to wash the dishes at the commune. Yeah. Nobody wants to do laundry. You know, nobody wants to cook food for the protest. Nobody wants to be the driver for the people getting out of jail, get, you know, when they get bailed out from the protest. Nobody wants to do the boring stuff. Mm -hmm. They want to do the uh, spectacular stuff. And so yeah. I guess if I have any other advice, it would be that there's a lot of boring stuff that needs doing to get you to the spectacular wins. There's mm -hmm. a lot of 
um, you know, I was I alluded to this a little bit, but you know, when we when we do our our our, um, our queer teen outreach space, a lot of times we're not doing anything spectacular. We're providing a break room for them mm -hmm. to hang out in. And the things that I'm doing is taking out the trash when the kids are done. It's um, standing out in the parking lot while all the kids get in their cars to make sure that nobody gets locked out of the building, you know? Yeah. It's uh, scrubbing down the toilet so that it's clean for when the kids get there. This is not like revolutionary army Kalashnikov shit. Yeah. It's just the work that needs to be done to create the space for these cool things to maybe happen sometime, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's the other thing I would say is just like, yes, great revolution. Can't wait. I'm here for it. Love it. But let's also focus in on the boring, boring stuff that needs to get done today yeah. that is helping people today, that is alleviating suffering today mm -hmm. in ways that nobody's going to write you up in a, in a newspaper article about it it's not going to go viral on twitter because you mm -hmm. you clean dishes for the soup kitchen not going to get the whatever. wikipedia page or yeah you're not it's not going to go on your page nobody's going to give you a cookie or you're not going to get a big round of applause it just needs to get done yeah. and that's where real activism happens is in the boring spaces yeah and i think too um I, I don't know how much you've heard of this concept because I only heard about it recently. Um, and as we all know, you know, my world's the only world. Um, but um, I, I heard the term manarchist recently. Um, and I thought it was, it was a really interesting article. Um, I'll have to find it. But um, it was about how when it came to a lot of like, just like leftist spaces in general, um, activist spaces, um, even anarchist spaces, yeah. Um, like, there's this unfortunate tendency sometimes um, for very, like, usually men, um, usually cis guys, um, where it's, um, you know, they want to be the ones that are throwing the rocks, right? They want to be the ones that are, um, you know, pushing back the police, right? They want to be the ones doing this and that. Um, but, like, you know, whether, like, if they don't want to listen to you know other people saying hey you know maybe we need more help in this area or hey that made me kind of uncomfortable or you know and i i think that that's like it's certainly not unique to our spaces of course um this is just you know microcosm of huge problems that exist everywhere kind of but like um i i think yeah like a big part of it too is just learning how to like um humility i guess to a certain extent but also just like learning to be more comfortable realizing you know like we don't need to be the super dominant voices we don't need to be the super like um bombastic folks right um you know it's sort of a um again like catchphrase or whatever um you know it's like listen to x group or whatever right but like you know there's i mean i know i have the tendency to i mean even to an extent with adhd but also i think you know i am privileged like um i do have the tendency to like speak over sometimes i do have the tendency to like assume i know more um and so it's like th there's sort of this um <laughs> we kind of have to like beat that down a little bit not because like we should therefore just always shut up and we should never talk about our own problems because we do always have our problems and like there is work we can do and there are things that like you know we're not like useless right i mean of course yeah. i'm not a guy but like um so you know I, ha I have my own marginalizations but like you know like there are there's always i guess like well there's always more to be done right um so yeah. kind of tying that in with one of my questions um, a bit earlier, or one of my questions a bit earlier in my document. <laughs> um, I wonder, like, um, sort of, as, I mean, I, again, I'm assuming you're cis. I don't, you know, I don't know. But, like, and you don't need to disclose or anything. But, like, um, I guess, you know, as literally that Dane dad, you know, as, um, you know, a leftist sort of... Um, 
you know, person who is, like, trying to kind of, like, fight for this more, like, better masculinity? Like, what are your thoughts on sort of, like, trying to reclaim masculinity or trying to um, sort of make it into this positive thing instead of, you know... Because I I don't know if I, like, necessarily agree with some people who say, like, you know, oh, it should be just completely thrown out. But, like, obviously there is sort of a perspective shift that needs to happen in the general kind of culture, so... This is a great question. I gotta hit the restroom. You're oh, fine. You're fine. That way I can focus on it. Uh, yep. I'll be right back. I guess I'll get more water quickly. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay. I, I got more water too, so you're fine. <laughs> I can repeat yeah, the question so, if you want me to. No, no, I got it. I, okay. I, it's in front of me right here, actually. Um, yeah, it's that's actually something I think about a lot because, um, yeah, I would say I. So yeah, I'm I'm definitely cis in the sense that you know I was assigned male at birth. I feel like that describes me um you know on the other hand i definitely i feel when i think about gender i guess for myself personally it's uh it's more of like a yes and Mm -hmm. (laughs) instead of a no but um and so like there's there's a sense for me personally where so when i was reading glitch feminism it was really um uh her her exploration of gender and kind of like breaking the binary Mm -hmm. you know as a political act i I found really compelling and um you know we're we're talking about that kind of like political political non-binary type of identity type of thing i don't it's it's a kind of thing where like i feel i feel comfortable as a man or as a male or as being perceived as male Although I feel like there's there's more to me also, I guess, in, mm-hmm. in a sense. But I don't, you know, I don't feel described by the word female or she or anything like that. But, you know, so I don't know. It's it's a, it's complex for me, I guess, right yeah. now, too. Um, no, for sure. And But, yeah, I, for, you know, for sake of simplicity, yeah, I, I definitely identify as cis and mm-hmm. um, as a cis man. And so, yeah, I think that's something that I've noticed a lot, particularly on my, on my commenters on my channel is, um, there are a lot of, uh, men that reach out to me through the comments and say, Hey, that was really, thank you for saying this about, you know, I've done videos on, you know, my fears as a dad, Mm -hmm. I've done videos on, you know, you know, apologizing when you're wrong or whatever. Um, yeah, I've, I've had men, message me and say thanks you know i i was raised with a different kind of understanding of masculinity but the you know what you are talking about feels better you know what i mean it yeah. feels more um healthier or whatever non-toxic or whatever and so i definitely feel i definitely feel like there's a there's a need or a, a hunger there for a different kind of masculinity um but it's tough because i i do think that a gender binary is very limiting Mm -hmm. i I feel like a binary view of the world and a binary view of society is is limiting and is like obviously there's not just two genders right right it's a it's a spectrum there's infinite genders or you know or or there's no i guess there's no such thing as gender and it's just words you know it's like yeah like that gets into complicated territory but yeah but yeah, it's like, so, so for me at this time, I'm, I'm also trying to broaden my understanding of gender and sexuality and mm-hmm. society and how we organize things. And, and so I also recognize that masculinity is a social construct that is in some sense arbitrary. You know, it's something that we've arbitrarily, you know, decided like, oh, this, this subset of people will have this thing called masculinity that they're supposed to aspire to and you know which i I don't think is 
maybe the you know necessarily the right way to do things either so it's so it's i guess i say all that to say it does feel like the world is yearning for a better a better version of masculinity and mm -hmm. respect that because the one we got now is pretty jacked up on the other hand i feel like the world is also yearning for us not to have to break break things out like that like yeah on the one hand yes i would like you to be a more not you personally but like yeah, i would yeah. like the i would like the the general person to um if masculinity is something that you want to aspire to mm -hmm. i would like you to aspire to a positive inclusive uh, uh just version of that on the other hand I would also like you not to feel like you have to aspire to anything, right? Right. You know? Yeah. So it's, so it's a tough question. But things being what they are now, the world being the way that it is now, yeah, I think I think part of what I try to do on my channel is to say, okay, you know, okay, fellas, we've grown up, we've grown up hearing this, and we've grown up being told this, and I'm here to tell you it doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. You can cry. You can experiment sexually and you can um you don't have to have all the answers and you mm -hmm. don't have to be the big protector you don't have to you don't have to be the big rock that doesn't get to experience emotions so that everybody else gets to you know what i mean like mm -hmm. we can do things differently you don't have to project pure confidence 24 7 mm -hmm. you don't have to be the provider um, or yeah 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 like um that's something that I try to do with my channel. And when I, when I lean into the dad persona, it is to subvert yeah. things that you may have heard, you know, um, uh, about dads that we have to be, you know, stoic and mm -hmm. um, things like that. And so like, that's why I, you know, I used to talk a lot about my daughter, you know, just be like, Hey, you know, dads can be, um, you know, dads can be excited about daughters, you mm -hmm. know, dads can be, um, oh, you know, and then the other thing too is like, there's a real dad culture of like, oh, I had a daughter, got to protect her from all the boys. That, <laughs> you know how boys are. And, uh, yeah. When he, when the guy, when he shows up to pick her up for prom, I'm going to be uh, polishing the and, shotgun. Yeah. And, and, oh my God, you know, it's just nasty, mm -hmm. <laughs> nasty stuff, you know? So part of the other reason that I lean into a dad persona on the channel is to be like, hey, you know, we don't have to do that. Yeah, that's we don't gotta we don't gotta act like that. That's nothing, right? But, mm -hmm. You know, there was a uh, do you know what next door is the uh, the social net social network for neighborhoods? I, yeah, um, I mean, I think um, I think actually my family sometimes uses it, but yeah. Yeah, so I signed up for it when we first moved into the house, and it is just... It's so really terrible. toxic on there, isn't it? I, I heard something like that, like... Well, it's just, it's just a bunch of... It's a bunch of homeowners that are just endlessly... What are the police doing on this block? Are there are there homeless people? I think I saw some teens. Are, did, did you... Is there a bunch of crime? It's just a bunch of... Uh, it's just a bunch of Karens looking out the window... <laughs> At the at uh, what is that? Are they moving into the uh, you know? Mm. But um, I remember I and I never engage on I never engage on next door because I just who has the time? But I just saw this one where somebody was they were posting that they had seen on their on their um, their nest camera that is you know because now we have to surveil all of suburbia has right. to be surveilled by a bunch of different little you know, uh, tyrants and rain yards, and all that like you know, suburban you know, yeah. And um, he saw some, he saw some teens sneaking through his driveway, looking into his car and trying the handles and then running off. And there was just this endless parade of guys in the comments just saying like, they should try it at my house, click, click. Oh, I'd love to go a little target practice. And yeah. I actually is the one thing I responded to and I was like, so just to be clear, you're fantasizing about um, murdering a teenager in your yard. Is that correct? And, you know, the guys go, oh, what are you talking about? My home is my castle. Yeah, you know? yeah. But it's just like, there's this, this sense of like, oh, what a man does is he kills. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, I would love it different. Yeah. <laughs> I would love a different, love a different conception of manhood. Mm -hmm. 
that we're we're fantasizing about killing teens is that what it's really come to mm. like so yeah i i think to the to the extent that i lean into a dad persona it it is to to say hey there's a different way of being a dad a dad can be um fatherhood can be something that is marked by excitement for your growing child that can be marked by acts of service for your family um you know one of, one of the things i said on my on one of my reflections of fatherhood was like hey other dads i better not catch you out there not changing diapers right like mm-hmm. part of being a dad is changing diapers man mm-hmm. um i do bath time every night i do story time every night like part of being a father can be nurturing mm. can be um snuggling with your child can be um acts of tenderness mm-hmm. you know what i mean like that's fatherhood too right and yeah. arguably i would hope that's predominantly fatherhood if your version of fatherhood is always a heavy hand and a closed fist and a gun at the door like you know is it how safe is your kid gonna feel mm. like if that's if that's their view of the men in the world <laughs> Yeah. You know, so yeah, I, I think that's something that's really important to me is to say that, you know, to the extent that I feel like we should aspire to a certain kind of masculinity, if you're somebody that aspires to masculinity, I'm kind of trying to do like a yes and yeah. instead of just like, um, like, yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. If there's an armed gang outside your door, great, grab your gun, whatever, dude, you got to protect your family. But on the other hand, given that the armed roving gangs of, you know, people from the purge. Yeah, that's, that's like what a, I was going to. Yeah, that's not your, that's probably not happening sort of seven days a week. Mm-hmm. So in the meantime, while mm-hmm. we wait for the masked gang to show up, maybe do the dishes, maybe mm-hmm. change diapers, maybe, you know, snuggle up for bedtimes and, mm-hmm. and, and do all these other things like let's yes and masculinity. Yeah. And and also, I think. To the extent that I can, I also would just want to let other men feel like they don't have to aspire to any kind of masculinity at all. Like, mm-hmm. if you are going to aspire to one, let it be positive and kind and just and nurturing and caring. But also, don't worry about it. Do do what you want to do. Be, be mm-hmm. into what you want to be into. Be the kind of person that you want to be. If you're a man that, you know, to to put you know to put it crudely you know if you're a man that wants to wear dresses great be a man that wears dresses if you're a man that wants to be a a stay-at-home dad who wears dresses and cultivates the gardens and that's the kind of man that uh, makes you thrive hell yeah let's do that be that kind of man a man can be whatever you want a man to be Mm -hmm. you know if you're a man the things that you do are apparently necessarily masculine. Mm-hmm. So great, masculinity masculinity can be whatever you want it to be yeah. if it helps you thrive and if it helps you treat other people well. Mm-hmm. You know, and better. I think um, something I've been thinking about, um, and I think I brought this up a little bit earlier, was just how, like, I don't personally understand, like, for instance, like the trans binary experience, right? But I think like. But to add on to that, I, I think that something I've sort of realized, and of course it's subject to change and whatnot, like, you know, maybe someone will say something else, just like, oh my god, I didn't even think about that. Um, but, like, just that there's, you know, like, it, we really need to, of course, like, just really hammer on those and break down those, like, walls of like okay like this is like what you you have to be right um this is what you know everyone expects you even if it's not like an explicit like you know yes you have to be this way or this way there is that like there's a lot of pressure um there's a lot of forces that are like just driving people into like feeling like they have to just be this way um and like i i guess and, you know, I don't know the perfect way of how this goes, and I'm sure it's going to be a long and gradual process, um, and it, which I think describes most of the stuff we've talked about today. But um, I, I think there is something, like, kind of... I don't know, like... There's something sweet and, like, hopeful, I guess, about, like, the idea of this, like... Instead of having that sort of, um, you know 
you only discover later that you know you can be this certain way and like but you can be other ways that is um and that for most of your life you think or maybe all of your life you think that you know you have to be this type of model like instead you know taking what you find positive in certain like groups of people or communities or whatever you want to call it and just like and you know if you identify kind of with that you know you can kind of vibe with them right and like being able to have that without having necessarily those strict rigid walls i think could be really useful um i mean of course it's it you know it's more difficult than just saying that but like yeah. um i don't know it, it i i feel like you know to the question of like in the future you know perfect utopia whatever right you know is there going to be like men and women right it's like maybe <laughs> if people want there to be but like it just won't but like they won't feel like they have to be as i what is what i would hope but yeah yeah i i think um yeah i don't it's you, know, you think about like a something like a star trek that takes place <laughs> what you know 400 500 years in the future you know yeah are we gonna are we gonna completely uh abolish gender by then i don't know yeah probably not I don't know. <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's hard to it's hard to picture it, you know. Mm -hmm. Even even if it's something that I think might be positive, it's like I can't picture it because right. you know a fish, a fish cannot imagine the beach. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because you grow up in water. Or, yeah. You know. But um, yeah, I think I think if I if if I could impart any vibe to people, it's just like yeah, you do you are allowed to be what you know who you want to be. You know, mm -hmm. like you it's it's cool to be like um it's just you're allowed to I, there's so many people that are just like there's so much anxiety I, mm -hmm. I think in a lot of people even among people that you know quote unquote should know better like people that are you know people that are into this or that theory or people mm -hmm. that are otherwise progressive in certain ways like there's, there's always this anxiety about whether am i do am i doing it right mm -hmm. am i the right kind of this am i the right kind of that you know you see am i really queer happen. enough you know like, yeah yeah oh yeah yeah you're... yeah speaking as a as a bisexual person like mm -hmm. queer enough as a whole it's a whole thing yeah um you know but like i see it a lot in the activist community am i doing enough am mm -hmm. i you know, uh, have I have I given enough? Am, have I, uh, you know, there's more. I have more time. I have more energy. I, I, gosh, I should. I'm I'm no activist. I'm not. I'm not out there. You know, chained to a bulldozer, or whatever it is. You know, and there's so much anxiety about. Am I? Am I enough for this category? And I I would love. I think that is something that's attainable in our lifetime. Is to create a culture that says stop don't you don't have to be enough anything mm -hmm. right like you don't you don't have to do that like yeah just treat people right treat yourself right you know one of the one of the rules that we have in the uh teen outreach a little mm -hmm. youth group one of the rules is we do not allow self-deprecating jokes yeah because, yeah because you know how people that have been traumatized queer people people on the margins that's a big defense mechanism and it's a big like pressure release valve to like well, nobody will make fun of, I'll make fun of myself so that nobody, you know, I'll get it out of the way. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, 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 no. You, you have to treat yourself with love too. Yeah, no, I've, I've other, had, sorry. Yeah, I just say, you treat yourself with love, treat other people with love. And beyond that, you don't have to be anything. You don't have to yeah. know, you know, we tell the teens like, they, you know, they'll come in and ask, am I, am I allowed to try a different name tonight? Am I allowed to try a different, like, if we have a trans closet, like, am I, can I wear something different tonight? Yeah. You don't have to be or do or say anything like mm -hmm. come here love yourself love your neighbor and beyond that go nuts go hog wilds <laughs> you know yeah and it, i i've had to like I, i've had to stop myself for instance from like making self-deprecating except english self-deprecating jokes um i i've it's something i've been learning um that yeah it's a defense mechanism right it's it's something that's like um you know we want to kind of put up this you know if i criticize myself i think this is like what bo burnham said um you know like if i criticize myself um before anyone else like criticizes me you know that kind of like absolves me or not even absolves but like you know it's this protective layer of like 
you know, okay, hopefully I won't be as hurt by this now, right? Yeah. But, I mean, it is kind of like, it, in a lot of ways, it hurts yourself. Um, and yeah. kind of learning that, you know, you need to take care of yourself, you need to love yourself, um, it's a super important, like, mm-hmm. idea that's not easy, but it's something that, like, we're all kind of working on. But yeah, um, I think that basically covers everything that I wanted to ask about. I don't know, I might be missing something, but like, um, I guess, yeah, like, you know, is there anything that um, either that you want to add or do you, you know, want to like shout yourself out or whatever, like? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I've been hyping up the old YouTube channel. I mean, yeah. it's, a pretty, it's a pretty chill space, so if you come on, come on down to that dang mm. dad, we got all kinds of weird videos on there but all kinds of stuff yeah you know one thing i think i uh one thing i've been uh, struggling with mm. sort of content creator wise you know because I, I have a lot of friends that are content creators yeah and all these little networks and things you know everybody's working hard putting out great stuff but whew, i am i don't know the way the world is going these days i am burnt out yeah on that's just a lot of stuff you yeah. know and, and i have the luxury of being burnt out but it's like there's man there's just a lot like I have close friends that are putting out great hour-long videos about deep, important topics. I'm just like, I do not have the bandwidth. Yeah, I don't have the emotional bandwidth to mm-hmm. engage with this right now. So uh, I will say, you know, as a kind of a funny plug for my channel, I do try to have a lot of goofy stuff on there. So <laughs> if you ever need a break, if you ever need a break from, if you ever need a break from uh, the, mm. the woes of the world, you know. You, I, I try to I try to have some like mm. you know there's a um was it Emma Goldman that said if if there's no uh if there's no dancing in your revolution I don't want any part of it. Yeah, I that's uh, what's often attributed to her. I think technically she like never said that, but she said something like similar, but yeah, yeah, yeah it, the concept, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's like I I try to have a little bit of dancing in my revolution yeah. just uh, you know, it can't it cannot be all business all the time mm-hmm. you know? but uh yeah but yeah this is this is fun yeah thank you so much i mean this has been like a really amazing conversation and i uh yeah, really appreciated fun. it i'm glad yeah well um I, yeah i guess um i'll see you later but <laughs> yeah. um yeah. have a great day well yeah thanks for inviting me this was fun yeah bye Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching. I know it's been a while, but hopefully this should keep you satisfied for a little bit. And thank you so much for the patrons who have stuck with me, and thank you in particular to my special patron, and coincidentally a very good friend of mine, Natalie Coleman. Everyone who has shown support to me over the course of this channel, and the long break that I had, it really means a lot to me. Thanks all.